Hi, my name is Lindsay Marr. I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Virginia Tech, and I'm pleased to be co-chairing this workshop with John Samet, Dean of the Colorado School of Public Health. We welcome you to the first in a three-part series of workshops on indoor air management of airborne pathogens. I'd like to acknowledge that while today we are gathered virtually, the National Academies is physically housed on the traditional land of the Nakutchank and Piscatani Piscataway peoples past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. We thank them for their resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities to their example. I wanna thank the planning committee, the National Academy staff and today's moderators and participants all of whom have worked hard to bring together this exciting event. This workshop is the first in a series of three. The next two in September will focus on schools and public transportation. We'll cover what we've learned, what's working, and what innovations are most promising in our efforts to reduce transmission of airborne pathogens. We'll also identify critical gaps in research, implementation, and regulation in these places. Stay tuned for the announcement next week. I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides now. And now I'd like to pass it over to uh, Dr. Salmon. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Lindsay, and welcome to um, everyone. I'm gonna just give a brief overview of the Environmental Health Matters Initiative, which uh, has organized uh, this workshop uh, as it did with the workshop that was held uh, two years ago. Next. The uh, Environmental Health Matters Initiative uh, cuts across the uh, National Academies. It has the goal of seeking to improve the health of all people equitably by promoting evidence-based assessment, prevention, adaptation, and strategic mitigation of complex and interconnected environmental stressors. And I will give uh, emphasis to complex and interconnected, and that underlies the approach that the EHMI has taken uh, in the workshops that uh, it has held. You can have the next. So the objectives are shown here. Uh, EHMI seeks to uh, engage the diverse stakeholders who figure into these complex problems. As with this workshop, it brings together scientists and others across uh, from across disciplines. Uh, it seeks to uh, develop trusted networks of scientists and stakeholders through its interactions with local, state, territorial, tribal, and uh, federal uh, collaborators. It seeks to understand what policies work and what makes um, a difference. And it focuses broadly on human health and ecosystem health. And then uh, it has the role with its flexibility to provide scientific input on a rapid basis uh, during crisis as occurred with the workshop uh, two, uh, two years ago. And now with this series of workshops and others that it has organized. Uh, next. The uh, underlying principles through which EHMI acts are shown uh, here, bringing together diverse groups, having its own uh, credibility and the credibility of the National Academy's uh, leadership from a variety of experienced uh, individuals who are on the committees and who are on the staff. And uh, EHMI, uh, as with other academies' activities, acts in a neutral, nonpartisan um, space. Next. So before turning things over to um, Lindsay, I just want to uh, acknowledge that we have uh, sponsors who come from a wide range of sectors. They include the CDC, the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences, EPA, uh, NIH uh, and ExxonMobil. I will say that uh, all of these sponsors have an interest in environmental health uh, issues, but they all recognize that the National Academies operates independently from any sponsorship. 
the EHMI parent committee has been involved in selecting workshops, the workshop topics, and a separate workshop planning committee has uh, uh, worked on this and the two subsequent um, workshops. So with that, let me turn uh, things back to you, Lindsay. Thanks. As a background for this workshop, two years ago, we had a workshop on airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, that was attended by, I think, 15,000 people at the time. And um, one of the, the main outputs of that was a proceedings that led to really some, some key publications that have helped shift the discussion about transmission and really updating our knowledge and understanding that COVID-19 is transmitted mainly through aerosols, tiny particles that we exhale, um, whether coughing or talking or, or just breathing. Um, and so in the current workshop now, what do we do about that? Well, the goals of this current workshop series is through panel discussions and participatory exercises to review the state of knowledge about building management, ventilation, and air cleaning for airborne pathogens, uh, to talk about experiences with management of indoor spaces during the pandemic, and to identify promising practices that can be adopted more widely to make these places safer. Uh, this is interdisciplinary and multi-sectoral. We have people from the natural, physical, and biological sciences and social sciences. Um, and then we also have people who are experienced with building operations, including managers, ventilation engineers, and users of public and private facilities. Um, this is, list shows our planning committee, which includes experts from a wide range, diverse range of different types of um, academic and non-academic backgrounds. And um, you can read their bios on the website. Um, and I want to kind of give an overview of, of the, our thinking behind this workshop. We are interested in taking research, practice, and theory or mechanistic understanding um, to figure out what works through adding in systemic, systematic review and expert judgment. Um, and so that tells us something about the efficacy, kind of like what we think should happen. Um, and then there's the, the next step of actually using what works, implementing that through organizational um, and individual actions and really looking at what the barriers have been to, to some of those, taking some of these actions. And then finally figuring out, well, does it, did it actually work? Um, and we need, in order for that to determine that, we'd need surveillance and evaluation. And that would then tell us the actual effectiveness of these different strategies. So here's an agenda uh, for today's workshop. At a glance, we have four different sessions. In the first session, we will review the current state of knowledge about buildings and airborne transmission. Um, in the second session, we'll look at scientific advances and innovations in management of indoor air. In the third session, we'll then look at organizational response and barriers to this. And then in the last session, we will have a fireside chat where we have agency and expert perspectives, um, also, they're sharing their experiences and opportunities. Um, at the end of the workshop series, we'll produce a report in the format of a proceedings in brief. Uh, the next two workshops after this will be highly interactive and we'll be looking at case studies in schools and on public transportation. Uh, participants will discuss their lived experiences during the pandemic. We'll also have breakout sessions to identify promising practices to make access to education and public transportation safer. We expect that these workshops will help pave the way for more effective management of indoor air when it comes to airborne pathogens. So let's get started with session one. The goals of our first session are to review the state of knowledge on building dynamics in indoor environments and what we have learned since 2020 about reducing transmission of airborne pathogens. Our first speaker is Dr. Don Milton, Professor of Environmental Health at the University of Maryland School of Public Health. And I'd like to take a minute moment to say that all the speakers and panelists bios are available on the workshops website. In the interest of time, we're not gonna go through those in detail here. And also those watching can submit questions at any time using the Slido platform 
and everyone can vote on the questions that we'll try to, we'll address as many of these as possible during our panel discussion after the two talks in this session. Um, Dr. Milton will be talking about what we have learned about SARS-CoV-2 transmission and indoor air, focusing on the source term. Dr. Milton, if you want to go ahead and turn on your camera, unmute and share your slides. Looks like we are ready to go. Everything looks great. Thanks. All right. Thank you. So thank you so much for inviting me today to talk about this uh, topic and follow up on the uh, seminar that webinar that we had two years ago now. Uh, what have we learned about the source term in that time? We've had lots of discussion about what uh, are aerosols? What, how do uh, viruses transmit? How does COVID get from one person to an, infect an, a, a one person or another? And one of the things that has been a big problem throughout the pandemic is um, a Tower of Babel about terminology. And um, I think that uh, Dr. Lee, who will be speaking later, has helped us a lot thinking about how to speak about these things in a way that communicates what we mean. By talking about uh, the, the modes of transmission in a way that identifies the, the, the how things happen, uh, less focus on the what thing is, not a droplet or what's a droplet, an aerosol, what are the cutoffs? Because we know from lots of work over many years that um, aerosols come in different sizes and how they behave, and we'll hear probably more about that later, depends on the size in the environment, but also when it enters your airways. Uh, very large particles get caught in the nose and throat, smaller particles penetrate into the airways, into your chest, and very tiny particles get all the way out to the alveolar sacs in the lung. And uh, for something like COVID, uh, the transmission, all it has to do is get into the airway somewhere. It doesn't matter that it gets all the way to the alveolus because it doesn't just infect alveolar cells, it infects cells throughout the airways. There's also spray with large droplets that can uh, be seen and felt when you get hit uh, and can land in the eye uh, and on the mouth and nose, but those are relatively small targets compared to inhaling air and the vast air, uh, area of the airways. Uh, and then you can touch things or people and transfer virus uh, to your susceptible tissues. So we've learned a lot about that and about how to talk about that over the last couple of years. Uh, we also know that people emit infectious virus. One of the first studies showing that there's infectious virus in the air was this one by John Lennecke published in 2020 showing that they were able to collect using a special kind of air sampler, uh, air from a hospital room with infected patients and culture virus from the air. Um, in my lab, we have been collecting virus uh, in, we've been collecting exhaled breath directly from people as they breathe, talk, sing, and spontaneously cough. Um, they don't tend to sneeze. We've seen very few sneezes, but we do see a fair amount of coughing, especially lately. And we've been able to culture the virus from that. Uh, a couple of groups have looked at the effect of just breathing versus talking and singing and show that uh, as you uh, vocalize, you generate more virus in the air. Uh, and uh, uh, Malin Alzved and the group in Lund in a beautifully designed study were able to show that people who shed virus in the air had detectable amounts of viral RNA in their exhaled breath were the ones who had other people in their homes infected, whereas those who did not 
didn't seem to be able to infect other people in their homes. In our group, we've been following uh, since uh, June of 2020, uh, people coming in with COVID and measuring how much viral RNA is in their breath. And what we have seen is that Alpha, Delta, and Omicron, the three variants of concern that are of concern in part because they have been shown to be more transmissible than other variants, are also associated with more virus shedding into the air. These three variants evolved independently. And so this suggests that convergent evolution is occurring where the selection is for things that are more transmissible seems to be a selection for getting better at creating aerosols. We've been able to culture the aerosols from breath, from uh, fine particle aerosols, especially also uh, once from coarse aerosols bigger than five microns. And we've cultured it from saliva and from mid turbinate swabs. But although we swab everybody's cell phone, we ask them to hand us your phone, we swab it, we have never been able to culture it from fomites. One of the things that's been key is that we are seeing that the saliva, the load in saliva, more so than the load in the nose, is a predictor of how much virus is in the breath. And this is important because, um, and also coughing, how often somebody coughs while they're giving the sample is important. But um, this thing about saliva, the point I wanna make is that we also found by following contacts of cases that people, had virus in their saliva before they had virus in their nasal swab. That measuring virus in a, uh, viral RNA in saliva was three times more likely to pick up an infection uh, early in the course of disease uh, than was swabbing the nose and doing PCR on the nose. Now think about rapid antigen tests. They are much less sensitive than PCR and it's using the nose. This is a problem because we know that transmission since early in the pandemic has been happening before people have onset of symptoms or right around the time they have onset of symptoms. Waiting until their rapid antigen test goes positive is not going to work to stop transmission because it's gonna detect it too late. We've also shown going back years ago uh, with flu that uh, putting surgical masks on limits the amount of aerosol that gets out from a person into the air. It coarse particles, it limits very well, but it also reduces in about by about half the amount in fine particle aerosol. Uh, this was a, shown to be true with seasonal coronaviruses in a paper that was published uh, in April of 2020. Uh, and we have now shown the same thing is true with um, face masks, that when you put on a face mask, it cuts down the coarse aerosol by about 75%. It cuts down the fine aerosol by about half. So that's not 100% but it's something, and that's why layers are important. On the other hand, if you wear a surgical mask as personal protective equipment, it's not adequate, especially for healthcare workers in high risk. Uh, a study in Boston hospitals following people with um, uh, exposure to patients and identifying cases among healthcare workers, tracking the exposure back and uh, doing sequences confirmed that healthcare workers were being infected even though they were wearing surgical masks. Surgical masks are not personal protective equipment against aerosols. This has been known in the occupational health field for decades. And we need to understand that this is an airborne transmission and therefore it's important to have real PPE. Layers are important source control, 
maybe with loose fitting masks can cut out half, maybe tight fitting masks can do a little better, but it's the combination of ventilation and masking and filtration that can dramatically reduce the transmission. And this has been now shown in a number of studies, especially in schools. But super spreading is what has really driven this pandemic. And that has been true, was true in, the, in early 2020. It's been true with Omicron. What happens is that there are some people, and you may have recall in those plots that I showed about the evolution of the virus, there were a lot of people who had middling or no shedding. There are a few people that shed a lot. And if they are around a lot of other people and the ventilation is inadequate, there's not masking, there's not filtration, you get this sort of explosive transmission and it just takes one person. Most people are not transmitting to anybody else or just a few people, but some people manage to transmit to a lot of people. So how do we protect against those things? Well, you know, getting people to wear masks is hard. Uh, and we've known forever in, in environmental health that there's a hierarchy of controls that trying to get people to do stuff to wear PPE is the last thing you try to do. Before, before that, you do administrative controls, change the way people behave, and that's also hard. Uh, so much better is to have things that are operating automatically in the background and protecting people without requiring them to do very much. And that's where engineering controls come in, like ventilation and filtration and air disinfection with UV. Germicidal UV uh, can be very effective. There have been now some uh, ex an animal experiment looking at hamsters. Uh, infected hamsters transmit Delta very well, as shown here, uh, to naive hamsters. But when the UV light is shined on the quartz tube connecting the chambers, there's no transmission. And uh, that has been using uh, conventional UV uh, that emits at 254 nanometers, but um, there are now new uh, technologies uh, emitting at shorter wavelengths that are easier and safer to use in the, instead of just in the upper room. And you'll hear more about that in subsequent talks. So in conclusion, there is extensive evidence now that airborne transmission is driving this pandemic. It's been cultured from room air and breath. There's more virus in the fine particles than the coarse particles, and those fine particles can remain suspended in air for a significant period of time. Aerosol shedding is associated with transmission. Highly contagious virus, uh, uh, variants of concern are also those viruses that shed into the air better. And that demonstrates convergent evolution of high air shed, assault shedding phenotype. Again, more evidence that airborne transmission is what's driving this. Testing and vaccination are insufficient to prevent transmission. Nasal swabs and rapid antigen testing cannot detect early contagious cases and vaccinated and boosted cases shed infectious virus into the air. And as I showed, we've cultured virus from the breath of people who've been vaccinated and boosted. So layers, including environmental interventions, are key. Super spreading remains a major factor. So masks, ventilation, and filtration can limit transmission. And germicidal UV holds tremendous promise to reduce transmission in high-risk environments, such as meeting houses, where uh, conference rooms, convention centers, schools, uh, and healthcare, such as waiting rooms, um, and needs to be explored uh, and employed in a much greater way. So thank you for your attention. Great, thank you so much, Don, for that excellent presentation. It's really inspiring to see how far we've come since in the past two and a half years, um, things that we, we hypothesized and made sense, like we really have solid, incontrovertible evidence for now about the virus <clears throat> being present in aerosols and 
um, needing the, the importance of uh, trying to manage this better uh, using engineering controls in our buildings. Our next speaker is Dr. Shelley Miller, Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Colorado. She will provide the Miller view of the state of knowledge regarding building performance to reduce transmission of airborne pathogens. Shelley, your slides look great. And Great, thanks for this invitation thanks. again to speak to the National Academy and the audience uh, two years post our previous meeting. Um, I will briefly just show you um, my outline for today. I have so much to say and so little time. So I'm highlighting a few of my favorite results, thus the Miller Review, that are important for indoor quality management from an, from an infection and transmission perspective. I think this question of aerosol transmission through ventilation ducts is quite interesting. Uh, what else have we learned about ventilation and filtration? I will focus mainly on those because UV is uh, a passion of mine, but that's going to be covered later. And then how do we best mitigate public buildings to reduce transmission? This question of is there aerosol transmission through ventilation ducts is, is critical for knowing where the cases come from and where they might, uh, where they might transmit to. We have seen multiple COVID-19 outbreaks along vertical lines in apartment buildings that use natural ventilation ducts to vent bathrooms. We have not seen transmission through mechanically ventilated buildings being studied or reported so far. So let me just cover this particular case. For example, 10 cases were, um, were discovered in this apartment building in Seoul, South Korea, along this one vertical line in the apartment building shown here. And in the middle, you can see this shaft that connects the, all the apartments with the same vertical line. It connects them through a bolt blowhole in the bathroom. Now, many apartment buildings are built like this, including in the Mediterranean, where I spent my sabbatical in Spain, and I st I'm studying a case of this kind of transmission in an apartment building in Spain as well. We can see this can happen when there's a reverse stack effect, when hot outside and cool inside, or when the stack is effect reverses and it's cold outside and warm inside. We have seen it in the building I'm studying when you turn on the kitchen exhaust or when you open the window to the patio, the flow reverses into the bathroom as opposed to going out of the bathroom into the stack, it comes into the bathroom where transmission can occur. So I think this is a critical thing we need to be looking at and to be advancing engineering controls. A simple fan and a simple um, duct cover is the way to go for these kinds of problems. Since 2020, what else have we learned? I think one of my favorite studies is this uh, one that shows ventilation and filtration can reduce environmental aerosol SARS-CoV-2 viral load. In this great study in um, Kevin Van Den Weimelenberg's group, which he will be here on a panel, they brought 11 diagnosed participants into a chamber and had them do work activities and, and high expiratory trials and measured both nasal swabs and aerosol. They did find a direct association between nasal swabs and the aerosol viral load. What's interesting here is they varied the ventilation in the space and saw that trials with low ventilation, less than 4.5 air changes per hour, were associated with significantly higher aerosol viral loads in the near field. Now, they didn't detect significance statistically in the far field, although it would look very different. We needed more measurements in the far field because it's a little bit harder to measure in the far field. The concentrations were lower. Also, when you put the whole total room together, you see that it's statistically significantly higher when you have this low ventilation rate of the virus aerosol. Filtration was also highly effective. When we add HEPA in room air cleaners, we showed that this significantly, or the, the research group showed that this was significantly lowering the viral aerosol load of SARS-CoV-2. We've also seen portable air cleaners reduce airborne SARS-CoV-2 virus in a study in Spain. During the third COVID wave in the winter, they studied nine households, seven of which were positive for COVID and two were not. They conducted 13 surface swabs and 16 air samples. I'll talk about the air samples briefly. 
The real-time PCR results for the air samples showed that they were positive for virus in the homes occupied by COVID-19 patients and negative in the control homes. And the air samples were negative for virus in all homes that used the portable air cleaner, except one. And in that one, the portable air cleaner was wrongly sized. It was too small for the room size. This is why we all provide tools and we emphasize size your air cleaner correctly because it needs to be big enough to clean the whole room. Now the graph on the right shows the, the home. So I star means the home with I had the air cleaner and then I without a star is no air cleaner. And um, so these data here, the PCR data shows the differentials um, between when you see the virus and when you don't see the virus with the air cleaner. These are the control homes and they're always um, negative for virus. I like this study as well. It comes out of University of Colorado Boulder out of John Zeiss group where they looked at, we usually use portable air cleaners to clean the whole space. So that's why we want you to size the air cleaner to clean the whole room. However, the question came up, is there a localized effect? So um, this study looked at um, putting an air cleaner on a table with four people talking, such as in a restaurant, doing both measurements and modeling. And they showed that these localized effects could reduce the particle levels between 40 and 90%, depending on the location in this space, this small space with the air cleaner cleaning right there between this, um, this table of four people. And so I think this is a very interesting result for air cleaners. There is, seems to be a localized result, as well as making sure that it cleans the whole room. I wanna put this all together now because when we really are at the point now where we have to figure out how to mitigate so many different kinds of public buildings, we can't go out to every single building and make measurements, uh, make studies of their ventilation and figure out which filtration works best for this particular school and that particular school in this particular office building. So we conducted a study um, looking at how do we do this um, with a modeling tool. We use the NIST model CONTAM, and it's a very powerful tool that's been used for decades to study air, indoor air management strategies. The air is only mixed within each zone. So if you have one floor and multiple offices in that floor or multiple classrooms, the air is only mixed in those small zones. And then we need to establish the flows between each zone. We also account for the meteorology. So that is an important driver in how a building functions. So in this study, we did Chicago in winter. We then estimated how infection risk was reduced when using ventilation, more filters, maybe some in-room air cleaners, maybe some UV upper room or induct, and then also masking. We looked at educational facilities, retail, hotel, and commercial office spaces. I'll just summarize briefly the results uh, here for the large commercial office building, that's 12 floors. We model this long range aerosol transmission. Now we did a pretty conservative problem here with one infected person uh, in the core zone on floor one and everyone susceptible in the building just sort of stayed in the building working hard the whole time. And uh, this could be something like, um, you know, high tech building, you know, Google where we have like cafeterias and gyms and you just stay in the building. Uh, there's 134 occupants per floor floor zone. Uh, we did do masks. Now we didn't do very efficient masks. We said 50% mm, efficiency exhalation, inhalation 30%. When we added HEPA air cleaners, uh, they were sized by different flow rates. So sometimes they were effective and sometimes they were um, undersized, but we always added UV in room at at least four air changes. And then the UV in duct single pass efficiency. We did see that the, um, the figure on the left shows the relative exposure risk of the whole building compared to the core zone. As expected, the core where the infected person was has the highest exposure risk because this is where the infector is located. Then the restroom on that same floor. On the higher floors, the stairs really ends up having the most risk, but it's low. Now the figure on the right shows the neutral pressure plane in the building starts at floor seven here. 
Floor to floor transmission is possible as the result of the dynamics of pressure distributions in the whole building. And higher floors could become vulnerable due to the combined effects of the stack effect and pressurization of the HVAC system. To mitigate exposure risk in the infectious zone, we first estimate the risk level for the building population. And we want to keep the outbreak from happening. So the parameter we used was the reproductive rate staying at one. The acceptable risk then was calculated for this building to be 0.75% because there are 134 occupants in the core zone. So this figure here shows the exposure risk for every mitigation strategy with and without masks. The dark blue is with masks, and we see every strategy works if there's universal masking, even baseline uh, low air change with a MERV-8 filter, all right? But if you don't have any mask, which is that, you know, that smallest part of the hierarchy that we're, that, that, that we're using, um, what we need to do is look to see which strategy works. And here what we see is the in-room UV works with 100% outside air or a very, very large office um, industrial size air cleaner that provides 10 air changes per hour. So very powerful. And this will mitigate risk um, in this space. Here I'm talking about the relative risk reduction compared to baseline ventilation in the infectious zone. And this is a way that we look at to see, well, which strategy is relatively more in, uh, effective than baseline? So in the next three figures, we will look at this parameter, the relative risk reduction. Here we see that upgrading the MERV filters from eight to 11 and 13 tend to be more effective for this building than adding small portable air cleaners for um, that compared to baseline ventilation. So these PAC one cubic meters per second, 1.45, these are small portable air cleaners more effective to add filtration in the ducts and increase the filtration effectiveness. Now the use of MERV-13 and in-duct UV with baseline ventilation provides similar performance to that of 100% outside air. Okay, so if you can't get to 100% outside air, well, this MERV-13 or the in-duct UV is an option for you. Uh, using, um, Let's go to the next one. And here we see the best strategies are um, using UV in room with 100% outside air, as I stated previously, uh, and this industrial size air cleaner. We can only reduce, uh, the highest we can reduce, reduce risk here is about 40% relative to baseline. Finally, mitigation in the HVAC ducts of the building reduce risks in the source zone, but they also reduce transmission between floors. So here we are looking at the first floor elevator shaft and the first floor stairs and looking to see how these are, risks are really quite low, especially with the, the um, mitigations in the HVAC ducts. Finally, we also investigated more building types. Here we have um, results for the school. In the table are the parameters for the secondary school that we simulated. Note that it has a very high outdoor air ratio of up, upwards of 70%. This can be, this is a, a common design in some schools. This is different than the office building, which was a low about 14% outside air. Uh, these graphics show that for these, this building, which already has a high design outdoor air supply, is limited the air cleaning potential of duct strategies. So all the portable air cleaners work well for these spaces. So here, for example, we have the UV room, um, the portable air cleaner, and the, uh, the large industrial size air cleaner all work very well to mitigate this, um, this classroom, as well as the auditorium and the school cafe. So in conclusion, my summary is that ventilation and air cleaning reduce viral aerosol loads indoors from COVID-19 infected individuals. 
love that study and would love to see, I see the animal study that John talked about for UV. So that's also exciting. For public buildings with reduced outdoor air supply, improving mer filtration, increasing outdoor air reduces infection risk throughout the building. For buildings with high outdoor air supply already, additional air cleaning need, is needed, particularly in small spaces to reduce the risk. And in-room germicidal UV is the only air cleaning strategy to universally reduce risk to acceptable levels in all buildings we studied in all scenarios, but so is masking. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Dr. Miller, for um, that excellent presentation. Seems like obviously there are a lot of different strategies that can work. Um, some are more effective than others. Um, I'd now like to introduce our panelists who will share their expertise during our discussion. So panelists, will you please um, turn on your video now so that we can see you? Thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Malin Alsved is a postdoctoral researcher at Lund University. Dr. Seema Lakdawalla is an associate professor formerly at the University of Pittsburgh and now at Emory University. Dr. Yugo Lee is a chair professor at the University of Hong Kong. Um, Dr. Bill Lindsley is a research biomedical engineer at the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, which is part of the CDC. Um, their bios are available on the workshop website. So we're going to, uh, we have some, some questions that we would from a mix of questions that we've thought about ahead of time to flesh out some of these, these talks in more detail. Um, and we will be reviewing audience questions too. And I encourage you to go to Slido to enter your questions and vote on other questions uh, rather than using the Q&A in Zoom. Thanks. Okay, so our first question is, can we accurately describe the relationship between the numbers of infected people and the loading of indoor air with infectious particles. Uh, Dr. Milton, would you like to start with that one? Um, you're muted. Can you unmute, please? Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, we, there's a tremendous variation between individuals, as I demonstrated. And so uh, the loading is going to depend both on the number of people and the shedding rate of the people uh, who are infected. So as you increase the number of people, the, uh, the probability of an infected person will go up depending on the prevalence in the area. And uh, then some fraction of those people uh, have the probability of shedding a lot of virus, but it's basically an additive uh, uh, thing. And the more people, the more crowding, the, the greater the likelihood that you've got somebody shedding virus. And the rate at which they shed and how much dilution and filtration you have is going to determine uh, what the concentration is in the air. Thanks. Um, Dr. Lee, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I, I, I think Don made a, a very good point in terms of uh, diversity and, and non-uniformity among people. And the loading of infectious uh, aerosols or particles in the indoor air also depends on the survivability of the virus, which depends on the environment, as, as, as Lindsay knows well, and, and, and as well as the uh, uh, dilution capacity of the space where people are. And I think someone also, I, I think Shelly also mentioned about non-uniformity of, uh, of the indoor air. So a lot of parameters. And I think we made a good progress in describing it, but probably not as accurately as we wished and also as it's needed. That's all. Yeah, I think the non-uniformity is an important point. It plumes matter. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how does that loading depend on activities and use of respiratory protection? Dr. Alsved? Yeah, so um, breathing, as we've found in our studies, is generally uh, generating less, both aerosol particles and um, viruses that 
or aerosol particles that carry viruses. While when you speak and when you sing, um, you use your vocal cords and vocalize, and that will generate both more particles if you're not infected and um, virus carrying particles if you are infected with COVID. So the activity plays an important role in, in how much you'll shed to, the, to your surroundings. Thanks. Um, Dr. Lindsley, I know you've done a lot of work on uh, masks. Could you speak towards that? Yeah, masks are actually a very effective way of reducing um, the amount of aerosol that's being expelled by people in the environment. And also, if you've got a really well-fitting mask or you've got a respirator, especially like an N95 respirator, um, not only is that extremely good at source control, but it also provides protection for the wearer. So those are both, uh, both effective for the person who's infected and also for the person who's uh, being exposed. Great, thanks. I'd like to turn to one of our um, questions from the audience, uh, which is, if um, how do we move from this kind of nebulous, well, we want to reduce the transmission to as low as reasonably practical to a, maybe a better balance between mitigation and then energy and cost? Because we haven't talked about this yet, but the you know many of the things we've talked about, increased ventilation, filtration, or UV, um, have have costs associated with them. Uh, Dr. Miller, could you take a stab at that? Sure, I think that's a really important consideration as we move forward. I wanna say that um, implementing germicidal UV in the upper room or indoor scenario is uh, low energy and also um, a, a lower cost, for example, than redoing your ventilation system. Uh, this is why the CDC has recommended it as a supplemental um, control to improve in increasing your ventilation if you can't increase it. I, I think that we need to move towards ventilation systems that are um, much more energy efficient, but when you do that, you also improve the filtration of the air that you're processing because you're doing a heat exchange or energy exchange type of ventilation system. So that would help with the filtration part. And then we have the DIY air cleaners. If you cannot afford uh, $500 air cleaner that's commercially manufactured. The DIY air cleaners are very $40, $60 a year to maintain and very effective. Great, thank you. Um, we're wondering, is there a correlation between the amount of virus in the air and other things that we might be able to measure more easily such as particles or CO2? Uh, Dr. Lindsley? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, there's one of the problems you run into when you're looking at things like respiratory uh, particles coming from people is there's a lot of other stuff in the air. And a lot of times the other stuff can dominate more than the particles. If you have like a room full of people, you'll get a lot of particles in the air, but only a small fraction that comes in the respiratory system. Um, CO2 is really useful. The one problem is if you want to look at something like filtration, um, a filter removes particles, it doesn't remove CO2. That can be, uh, that can be an important complication. Great, thank you. Um, there have been a number of questions about UV um, and the use of UV in occupied rooms. Uh, uh, maybe Dr. Miller and Dr. Milton, I, we'd like to hear from you on that. Sure, how about I talk about germicidal 254, upper room UV and Don, you can take the far UV. Just briefly, um, 254 UV has been used for decades. Um, to clean the upper part of the room and the radiation is directed only in the upper part of the room. So the air has to be mixed in the whole room, which most indoor spaces are reasonably well mixed. And so then the occupied space does not receive any radiation, but the radiation is up in the upper zone and you, and you dose the room to make sure that this is correct and, and it's been in, implemented and used safely for um, many years in facilities like homeless shelters in Boston, hospitals around the world, for example. John? Yeah, um, FAR UV is a, a newer technology. Uh, we've been employing it here to some extent at the University of Maryland. Um, if I can share this picture of Dean Lushniak at our commencement with UV fixtures right behind him there. Um, you can see that uh, th this is is something that can um, be put up even in, in, in portable installations. Um, 
actually there's now a, a, a capability some capability to do upper room uv and portable installations and we've been using that at recent meetings that i've been attending um and it it has the far uv has the advantage that it, it's relatively eye safe and so you don't have to isolate it in in the upper room uh and i think that uh eventually it will uh hopefully be much more uh commercially it's commercially available now um and in the future i hope the cost will come down as it um becomes uh as production goes up and uh technology improves thank you i have a kind of a bundle of questions here next um does the risk of infection vary inversely with ventilation so more ventilation lower risk uh, which i'd like to direct to um Let's see. Well, there's a, a more specific question actually from the audience, which is about the number of air changes per hour. How do they, how many do you need to result in practically reduced transmission risk? Um, and then I'd like to come, like to talk with, let's see, I think uh, Shelly about that and Yugo, and then we'll go to Dr. Lakdawalla, Seema Lakdawalla on kind of how these levels of virus um, relate to the risk of actual infection. So let's start with um, Shelly here. Sure, I think the ACH question um, is an interesting one. The, the study that I talked about showed, you know, definitely lower than 4.5 has higher virus and greater than nine has lower virus, okay? We have been recommending six as a really a pretty high target to to implement and this is based on um some a, a modeling understanding of the of the indoor environment and also some work that has come out of the tb world and and so the the literature on tb has helped us to say well i think this is a good target now maybe i'd love to hear what Hugo says um for for adding some context to this question yeah, uh, continuing from Shelley's uh, uh, nice comments, I, I guess, uh, I mean, the, there is a difference between uh, a ventilation rate, which measures in liter per second and air change power, and infection uh, risk as shown by Wells Riley, obviously is related to ventilation rate, not air change power. But air change power is very easy to use, in particular in the medical field. And TB, we know six air change power, 12 air change power, right? I think that's number one. And then one complexity with air change power is about occupant density. So in, in some places like uh, classrooms, as Shelly just modeled, and in crowded environment, air change power may be high, but ventilation rate per person, per capita, may be low. So uh, for restaurant in Hong Kong, we use six air change power. It seems working rather well. It's about seven or 7.5 liter per second per person. But with air change power, there's another complexity. How do you estimate the air volume in practice? So anyway, that's my question, uh, comment. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lakdawala, could you uh, comment on kind of the amount of virus in the air, how much people are exposed to and the risk of transmission and infection? Yeah, I think this is a really good point, right? When we talk about um, infection risk in each environment. So obviously Don's work has shown that people expel aerosols that contain virus, like particularly infectious virus, right? Because there could be a lot of RNA in the air, but some of them may be degraded and you are, wouldn't ever initiate an infection. Um, there's really nice work that was done um, in the UK with an actual human challenge study where, where, in, where um, volunteers were infected with SARS-CoV-2 and they found that, you know, really less than 10 particles uh, could initiate an infection in individuals. Um, and so that's really fascinating to think about. So you don't need a lot to become infected. Um, and we know that it's present in the air. Um, and so how that changes now though with uh, vaccination and um, prior immunity is gonna be really interesting to find out, right? What the human infectious dose is. We know that immunity to viruses or like flu, um, as a perfect example, um, can change the infectious dose needed to become infected to overcome the immune barrier um, within us. And that can change how long the exposure or time you need in order to become infected. I have a comment though, Lindsay, on the um, UV that I would actually like to pose as sort of a, a point on this. Um, 
because I think it's important when we talk about the, the impact of UV having in both the upper room air and in other spaces is that it's really targeting one mode of transmission. And as Don showed in his you know, slide deck, transmission happens in lots of different modes. Um, and at close range, we're exposed to aerosols and plumes that are a wide range of sizes. And so close range transmission may not be uh, impacted by UV treatment. And I think a really important take home here is when we think about ways to engineer spaces, how do we um, do so to target multiple modes of transmission, um, right? Both thinking about small aerosols like maybe targeted by UV in these sort of um, upper room air type scenarios, uh, but also uh, ones that might be happening at close range. Um, so I just wanted to pose that as well. Yeah, that's an important point. And um, that is one of the reasons why there's tremendous interest in far UV, because ceiling mounted far UV shining straight down can potentially disinfect air at short range. We need the work to demonstrate whether that can, can be achieved and what rates of um, uh, uh, UV input into the space you need to achieve that. Uh, but, but it's certainly within the realm of possibility. Um, and uh, with the, we will hear uh, a later talk uh, from you and Edie about this, but they've achieved, you know, well over a uh, uh, hundred air changes an hour with uh, direct UV. Um, now, it's not to say that you can't get to those kinds of levels with upper room UV as well, uh, but then you need to pay a lot of attention to air mixing and, and plumes uh, are very important. And that's where I think that it's the combination of, uh, of upper room UV and ceiling fans, which are the most effective way of mixing air um, that need to be, we need to be paying attention to. Thanks. And if this is, this is not the last we'll be hearing about UV, um, it'll be in session two. Uh, Dr. Miller. Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, thank you Seema for bringing up this important point, but I also wanna, emphasize that this is an issue with all engineering controls, right? The, the, the main HVAC system is designed to clean, you know, the general airspace. So is in-room air cleaners, unless you're trying to use them in a localized way, which we have seen they clean localized, which could be the near field transmission effect. So I think, you know, when you're designing your mitigation strategies, you first look at how do we make sure the entire building space is clean, the, the whole building, and then we go to the next level, which is we're going to have near field transmission. What do we do about those situations? Do we have enough mitigations or plans in place to, to decrease that, which just could be a different kind of administrative control strategy because engineering, engineering controls are not great at near field transmission redu reduction. Right. Excellent point from everyone. Um, the last question is really for all of our panelists, which is what type of practical steps um, do you feel like are most promising that you would take at the kind of building level uh, to uh, to reduce transmission of this of SARS-CoV-2 and really other respiratory viruses also? Uh, let's start with Dr. Alsvid. Um, yeah, I think ventilation is really important. Um, one thing that could be, but we haven't discussed, is um, the ability of not talking, like having indoor spaces that allows that you don't sit close and scream to each other, since we've seen in several studies that being loud actually emits more aerosols. Um, so that, yeah, noisy spaces is not good. Like sitting close and screaming to each other is not good. <laughs> so, and that with ventilation and some, uh, yeah, masks in case you have to be close as well. Great, thanks. Um, Dr. Lindsley? Yeah, I think portable air cleaners, I think, have a lot of potential. They could be more widely distributed, like in schools and places like that. I think there's a lot of a lot more to be done there. Okay. Uh, Dr. Milton. Yeah, I think that um, we're not going to close down all the bars, and people are going to get close together and shout at each other. So we need to be paying attention to both the long and short-range transmission, and I think all of the things we've been talking about, filtration, local uh, filtration, uh, upper room UV with ceiling fans to get good mixing, direct UV. We're, it's going to take all of these things in combinations. Dr. Miller? 
Yeah, I just have to agree with um, with, of course, everything that has been said. But I would I would really love to emphasize, you know, the U.S. embracing more um, more use of UV in public spaces. I think there's been a, a, a shying away of this technology because it's not understood. But there are lots of um, there are there's lots of expertise and there's lots of evidence that it works and we need to use it in places where it's needed, like as Don says, bars and, and restaurants and school, you know, there's applications. And so I, I'd love to see more emphasis on that and also implementing it with um, energy efficient ventilation. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Yeah, I, I, I agree with all being said and then, but I'd like to go back to what Don mentioned, emphasize about super spreading events. Although we do not know the minimum ventilation rate or dilution rate, but we can avoid the worst and avoid the poorly ventilated spaces by uh, doing a minimum performance of our buildings. Whether it's four air change power, six air change power, do one, avoid the one air change power, 0.5 air change power. I think that's probably a little message there. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Lakdawala. Yeah, I, I think everyone sort of hit on the main topics. I actually wanted to also say that for a lot of other viruses, right, respiratory viruses like RSV and rhinovirus, they didn't go away like flu did during the 2009, uh, during the 2019 COVID pandemic. And it might be that the modes of transmission of other respiratory viruses, uh, the efficiency of each mode are slightly different, and we really need to start to understand that. So having multiple strategies, not only that impact aerosol transmission, but perhaps larger range transmission, uh, large droplet transmission and other strategies uh, and thinking about why those viruses transmitted and other ones didn't. And again, coming back to the multiple layers, I think is critical. Thanks. Great. Um, we could talk about this for days. Um, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for sharing their expertise and our speakers, um, Dr. Miller and Dr. Milton. Also, we are now going to transition to session two, which is moderated by Dr. William Banfleth, a professor of architectural engineering at Pennsylvania State University. Hey, uh, thank you, uh, Lindsay, and uh, glad to be here with you today to moderate this session on scientific advances and innovation. Uh, the goals of, of this session are to review promising innovations and optimization of existing technologies to reduce the risk of infections in enclosed environments and learn about where we stand in terms of efficacy and standardization of selected technologies and how these technologies have been used or are um, going to be used. So we have a similar format to the uh, first session. We have three speakers who will give a short seven to 10 minute talks and then we'll add some panelists and have a discussion. Our first speaker is uh, Andrew Persley from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, speaking on ventilation management to reduce airborne transmission risks and improve indoor air quality. Looks like you've almost got your slides up there, Andy. Yes, I'm waiting for them below. Can you hear me? Yeah, we're seeing your presenter view right now. Oh, well, let's just switch screens. Whoops. Yeah, sometimes it's more cooperative than others, isn't it? Um, you swap displays with that? Yeah, but my cursor doesn't want to go up here. I'm sorry. Uh, there we go. There we go. There we go. Okay. All right. Good. Take it away. Great. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Bill. Um, yeah, I'm talking about ventilation management, which is a whole lot better than mismanaging or neglecting ventilation, which is what's been happening in our buildings for far too long. You know, way way before the pandemic. Um, you know, Shelley provided some good evidence on the effectiveness of ventilation in reducing um, infection risk and totally agree with her, but that's only if the ventilation happens, only if it's well managed. And I will point out that um, managing ventilation will also improve indoor air quality. In some cases, it will um, in, um, improve building energy efficiency. That's what we call a threefer. So uh, I wanna start out by just highlighting some of the recommendations that we've seen on how to manage ventilation in buildings. The first one is perhaps my favorite, which is to make sure, take a look at the system, make sure it's operating as it's intended to operate. That is not uh, always the case. In, in fact, it, it doesn't happen a lot. And, and you can compare the operation to the system design, to the relevant ventilation standards, 
And part of that, I, I would say there are recommendations to change the existing standards to require more ventilation, more filtration and other things. And speaking of more, there's recommendations for more outdoor air, more filtration, more open windows and so on. We'll see statements that if concentration is below some uh, particular value, that's an indicator that the ventilation is good and the infection risk is low. I didn't put a value in because I don't know what it is. Talk about that later on. And then there's recommendations to improve air distribution to get the air to the occupants and remove the aerosols. And then the last line are some miscellaneous recommendations that I uh, don't have time to talk about. Um, one point I want to make is that buildings and buildings ventilation systems are extremely variable. There's a lot of buildings in the country and, and even more in the world. Everyone's a, a special story. And the systems in these buildings are also quite variable and they impact what you can do. Um, and you know, if you're thinking about doing something different with ventilation, you gotta take a look at your system type and how it's operated. Does it, do you have mechanical ventilation? How is the outdoor air intake controlled? Can you bring more air into the building? A lot of folks are saying, you know, bring more outdoor air into the building. Well, that's, you know, if the outdoor air is clean and dry, that, that's great. But in August, in certain parts uh, of the world, that air is hot and humid, and your system may not be able to handle it and can cause other problems. Some mechanical ventilation systems are extremely limited in, in what you can do with them. I'm thinking window air conditioners and fan coil units. Uh, natural ventilation, we, we heard about that earlier. Um, that, you know, less options for improving ventilation there. You might have to go to, you know, portable air cleaners and other, other strategies. And it depends a lot on whether your natural ventilation system is just operable windows or it's a truly engineered system where the airflows are based on physics, not uh, wishful thinking. And then finally, a lot of buildings are only ventilated by infiltration. Most US homes do not have outdoor air ventilation systems. And again, that limits your options. So the first thing to do is understand your system and then consider your options. The uh, reference cited there is a chapter I uh, wrote for on, on evaluating ventilation perf performance for recently published handbook on indoor air quality. I'm not going to go all through all this stuff, but it's a matter of looking at the, the system design, evaluating performance, and then there's some other really important things to look at. In terms of the design, I will note that not all buildings, you can't always find the design documentation for, for too many buildings, which is unfortunate. Um, and if you're going to measure it, you know, I want to state clearly that you know ventilation rates and airflows in buildings are extremely variable and one measurement won't tell you very much and here's just some plots showing the variability i'm not going to go into this look at this 2016 paper in, in indoor air if you want to learn more about uh, how air change rates vary in buildings <clears throat> we've heard about co2 monitoring sure it, sure it could be useful but you got to understand what you're doing and you've got to do it carefully. And there's a long history of confusion and misinterpretation with regards to indoor CO2. We're seeing a lot more measurement now. We're seeing less expensive sensors. We're seeing guidance, but I will state that not all the guidance is terribly clear or very well explained technically. There's really two reasons to monitor CO2 in this context. One is to use it as a tracer gas to verify that you are achieving the ventilation rate that you or someone feels is protective against infection risk. I don't know what that rate is, but I know how to measure, you know, or we know how to measure uh, ventilation rates using CO2 as a tracer gas. The other reason to do it is to use CO2 as a direct or indirect indicator of transmission risk. And that last bullet there, if you're going to measure CO2 and you're going to report the value, don't just give the concentration. You need the context. You need some of this information listed here. If you want to learn more about these aspects of CO, indoor CO2 and others, ASHRAE published a position document on indoor CO2 last February, free download. Um, hopefully you'll 
find it interesting and useful. Earlier on, I said, I don't know what the value is for CO2 to uh, demonstrate adequate ventilation. And I've, I've got to say, I'm a little skeptical of using the same value for all spaces. It doesn't make sense to me because the, the CO2 concentration for a given space will depend on when you measure it relative to the occupancy schedule, how many occupants are in there and, and basically how much CO2 they're releasing, and then the target ventilation rate. You want to say ventilation is adequate? Well, you need a target. You can get that from the design. You can get that from the standards. You can get that from some of the uh, individuals on the call today. But you need to consider those things and come up with a what, what I'm calling a space-specific CO2 metric. Just published a paper in Indoor Air Journal on this concept. And we have an online tool, Quick CO2, where you can make these calculations and uh, I'll be interested in, in folks' experience um, with this approach. But we're about innovation today. Well, I think the first innovation is do things right. Make sure the system's operating is intended and understand it before you make changes. This would be incredibly innovative. You want new stuff? Well, there's you know some air distribution technologies, personal ventilation, and so on. The last new stuff I list here is to revise the existing ventilation and IAQ standards to address airborne infection risk more directly. And to wrap up, um, managing ventilation is not trivial, but it's not rocket science either. It's not trivial because every system and building is unique and dynamic. It's not rocket science because we know we have the knowledge. In terms of CO2, it, it's a tool. You know, it, it, uh, but not every, you know, not every problem is a nail to hammer in with CO2. And you gotta, you gotta understand what you do and to do it carefully. You want innovation, operate systems as intended. That would be a huge step. And then the last point I wanna make is about, you know, a lot of the stuff is relatively straightforward to do in buildings where you have a budget and you have a conscientious building owner and you have the resources, but there are a lot of buildings, I'm calling them neglected buildings that don't fall into that category. Lots of buildings, lots of occupants, lots of work that needs to be done. And I'll just show this list of publications. The first one hasn't been published yet. The uh, National Academy of Engineering Bridge Journal, they're gonna post that next week, they tell me. And with that, thank you very much, Bill, and everyone else. Okay, thank you very much, Andy, for that, that great presentation. Um, we'll move right along now to our next speaker, Brent Stevens from the Illinois Institute of Technology, and he'll be speaking on filtration and air cleaning for airborne pathogens. All right, are we up? Good to go. Okay, great. Well, thanks um, for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak briefly today. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about, you know, what we know about filtration and air cleaning for airborne pathogens, some of which has already been covered, but also, uh, importantly, kind of what to look for when you're making decisions, you know, um, in, in this space. Um, so as has kind of been covered, you know, I really group air cleaning into two types of technologies, right? One is sort of portable, standalone, or in-room you know, air cleaning devices that, that treat uh, air uh, in the space that they're, that they're serving. And then the other, as has been mentioned by Dr. Miller and others, is induct uh, air cleaners, uh, you know, that are integrated within HVAC systems uh, that serve the spaces in which we occupy. Uh, now, within any kind of air cleaning device or system, you could have many types of air cleaning technologies. Um, we've sort of, I kind of group these into two main categories, although there can kind of be some overlap between the two. On one hand, you have subtractive technologies. On the other hand, you have um, what I would call additive technologies. Um, so subtractive technologies, their mechanism of action is that they you know, remove or inactivate you know, targeted contaminants, for example, pathogens uh, from indoor air, but when they come in contact with that technology. So examples are filters um, that remove particles, uh, electrostatic precipitators is another type of technology that removes particles or as was mentioned, UVGI, I kind of put them in subtractive because while they add UV, they're, you know, you still have to kind of, you have pathogens come in contact with their path. Um, so some key parameters that you've got to know that kind of from an engineering perspective are just the efficiency or the single pass removal efficiency of that technology. Uh, that's essentially a measure of what goes out versus what comes in. Um, you also need to know the airflow rate through that system or that device. 
um, the relative, uh, the airflow rate relative to the size of the space or the volume of the space that it's serving. Uh, simple things like runtime, is the system running? Um, and then also for some of these technologies, you do have a potential for byproduct formation. For example, ozone can be formed by uh, electrostatic precipitators. Uh, and on the other end of the spectrum, additive technologies are those whose mechanism of action is really adding constituents that might be ions or reactive compounds uh, to the air to remove particles or inactivate microorganisms. There's a broad class of categories here uh, with sort of ever evolving names from ionizers to ozone to plasma generators and a variety of reactive oxygen species generators like uh, hydrogen peroxide generators or hydroxyl radical generators. Uh, so there's a number of key parameters to understand here, as well as for if you want to understand the impact that additive technologies may or may not have on, on indirect quality in a space. Uh, that's the type and amount of additives that are delivered, um, any potential toxicity or, or adverse effects of those additives, uh, both to pathogens uh, uh, and to people. Um, and then is there any potential for byproduct formation, for example, forming particles or gases um, uh, and, and any potential toxicity associated with those? Um, there's been a, a number of papers in the last you know, couple of years that have, that have shown a variety of particle and gas phase formation from a, a wide variety of, of um, uh, additive electronic air cleaning uh, devices. Uh, and what's really important to know is that some air cleaners use a combination of technologies. They might combine filters with UV or uh, ions with filters and UV or one or the other, one or you know, two or three and so on and so forth. Uh, some of those can be turned on and off and so forth, but you really want to understand what those technologies are within a given device. And it can be hard to understand sometimes. Um, and so where are we currently? This has already been mentioned. Uh, filtration and air cleaning is essentially recommended to reduce risk. Um, you know, the CDC and their guidance on COVID and, and ventilation for COVID in buildings uh, has been pretty consistent with uh, improving central air filtration, more is better. Uh, uh, stacking, you know, and using uh, HEPA fan and filtration systems, uh, portable systems, um, and then supplementing with UVGI. The big, the big thing to know is that these these things can all be additive. So you're kind of in a land of more is more is better um, to, to an extent. Uh, now, one thing I want to point out is in the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force core recommendations. Um, in addition to maintaining minimum ventilation and improving central filtration, um, there's a, um, a recommendation to use air cleaners for which uh, evidence of effectiveness and safety is clear. So the question is, how do you know if um, air cleaning technology is effective uh, and safe? And so the first thing you, you really have to do is seek performance data, right? So the, the ideal set of performance data would be uh, test results from standard test methods and metrics uh, resulting from you know, independent tests or peer-reviewed literature, or, or at least you know, uh, tests that have run through um, a, a kind of an industry consensus standard. And now there are a number of uh, tests, uh, standard test methods and metrics for determining the efficacy of both in-duct and portable or standalone uh, air cleaners. And so those are listed below. We won't go into too much detail, uh, but it doesn't cover kind of everything and every type of technology. Um, also, in terms of the safety aspect, uh, if you're concerned about something like byproduct formation or, or primary emissions of something like ozone, we do have ozone emission standards. There's two of those from UL. One's kind of a low emission standard, the other's near zero. Um, but we don't really have byproduct formation test standards and, and metrics yet. That's kind of in the works, um, but, but you don't have much yet. So you have to rely on other sources. Uh, of course, in the red column there, the, the, the least useful kind of performance data would be none at all. Uh, but somewhere in the middle, you get what I would call potentially or sometimes useful uh, performance data that are pro that's provided for a technology or a device. Um, this is usually like a non-standardized test method and metric that's been used, um, maybe published in the liter peer-reviewed literature, but more often than not provided by the manufacturer um, um, uh, and, and, in, and in their literature and so on. So I'll, I'll speak a little bit about kind of some of the things you have to look out for. Um, in interpreting uh, performance data, because that's the next step, right? Once you have data, you've got to interpret the data. And so first off, for standardized tests and metrics, it's really pretty straightforward, which is useful. Uh, for single pass efficiency tests, right? This, how much of a pollutant comes out versus how much goes in. Um, uh, for filters, there's a wide variety of acronyms, uh, MERV, uh, HEPA, there's other, other, other versions. Uh, essentially for each one of those, if you've got that labeled on a product, the more, the better. Right. Um, uh, ASHRAE also has a, a standard 185.1 for UV uh, induct efficacy. 
Uh, so you, you can look for these things to help inform your decisions. And generally, the higher the rating, the higher the removal. Uh, and then for uh, if you only have sort of efficiency data, you also still need to know other things about the system. You need to know the flow rate through the, through the filter or the air cleaner to determine its impact. And you can calculate an effective clean air delivery rate or a CADR if you know both of those things. Um, now, speaking of clean air delivery rate or CADR, um, this um, is, a, is a very useful term for uh, comparing technologies and the impacts that they can have on pollutant removal, including pathogen removal. And so the most widely used is the um, Associated Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers, AHAM's AC1 test method. It's a test chamber where you inject particles and measure the decay with and without the air cleaner operating. And out comes a CADR. It can, it's very useful for testing portable or in-room air cleaners. Uh, AHAM on their website has something like 800 uh, products that have been tested for a CADR. And you'll see products range commonly from maybe 25 or 50 CFM at the very bottom, cubic feet per minute of clean air delivered of a certain size range, uh, which translates to the size range of particles that are of concern for airborne infectious disease transmission. Uh, you see that at maybe 25, 50 CFM at the low end, up to like 500 CFM at uh, CADR at the high end. Uh, and again, the higher the CADR, the greater the removal that you'll have. Uh, one really important note of caution is you may see a CADR on a product uh, for a device, but make sure you know what units it's in. Sometimes uh, you'll see different units used. I've seen like cubic meters per hour, which actually gives you a larger number than CFM. So you have to convert, you have to nearly be an engineer, right? To, to evaluate these. Uh, I've also seen things like liters of air per day, which can be kind of confusing to interpret 28,000 liters per air per day or something like that. Um, now, interestingly, the do-it-yourself solution, like the Corsi Rosenthal box solution, where you kind of strap MERV 13 filters or higher, uh, to a box fan, you know, these are recently tested and shown to deliver up to like 800 CADR um, in, in cubic feet per minute for particle sizes of interest um, at much lower cost than a lot of commercial solutions, at least upfront cost. So those are really promising, um, so, um, as many of you know. Um, and interpreting, when it comes to interpreting performance data from um, non-standardized tests and metrics, you really kind of have to have a little bit more level of interpretation. Uh, a classic example throughout the years is um, um, microbial inactivation tests that come from chamber tests. Um, for example, you'll see an air cleaning technology, you know, reduces viable pathogens by 99% in, in an hour in a test chamber. And you may be provided with data from a test report that looks like this at one hour, you know, E. coli is um, uh, reduced with the air cleaning technology operating in the chamber. Um, by 99%, you know, compared to the control condition, which just uh, is the background loss rate. Uh, well, me and some colleagues have recently published a, um, a, an article in the ASHRAE journal that um, help you try to interpret this performance data. So interestingly, when you take that, although 99% sounds, you know, quite, quite good, if you fit that data to like a um, first order uh, linear biological decay model, you can calculate the relative loss rates and that's what really matters in this space and if you compare those loss rates uh, against each other you can get an equivalent CADR of a, of a technology like this that is maybe only like 22 cubic feet per minute so on the very low end of the products that are uh, kind of available on the market um, and it's worth noting that a 250 uh, CFM um, cleaner delivery rate air cleaner in that same change, uh, chamber would give you far more reduction 99.999 plus percent um, in, in an hour. Um, so just be careful. We've also, uh, my colleague Elliot Gall at Portland State has led a uh, collaborative um, construction of this spreadsheet tool, ACIT, the Air Cleaner Efficacy Investigation Tool, where you can kind of plug in air, air cleaner performance data uh, to try to yield um, uh, um, uh, metrics that you can translate or try to translate to real world spaces uh, and compare to other technologies. Um, and so my last two slides here, I'll, I'll finish with for non standardized test methods metrics, um, you really have a number of questions to ask because without that level of standardization, you, you're kind of in the, in the woods or in the dark. Um, so you wanna know if you have test data for a product or a technology from chamber test results or from chamber tests, you know, you wanna know how does that translate to standard metrics or other metrics in real life conditions? You know, what was the chamber size? How does the chamber size affect interpretation of the results, if at all? Um, you know, for additive technologies that add constituents, reactive constituents to the air and so forth, you want to know that for that efficacy performance data, was it tested at real world 
constituent levels um, that you would see in real spaces. And were any chemical or particle byproducts measured, is that a concern? Uh, for air cleaners with multiple technologies, again, something that might combine a UV system plus an ionization system, which technologies were active during testing and were they ever tested with one on, one off and so forth? So what is really contributing to the efficacy? Um, those are good questions to ask. Um, so I wanna thank um, my uh, close collaborators, L.A. Gall, Delphine Farmer and Mohammed Haider Najad, especially, because uh, a lot of this content and thought process comes from uh, an article that we published earlier this year in the ASHRAE Journal, where we try to help people interpret air cleaner performance data. Uh, and then I just provide another, uh, a, a number of helpful um, uh, resources here um, uh, via these links, including um, the ASHRAE position document on filtration and air cleaning, which is a really, really useful tool, uh, and, and these others as well. So thank you. Thanks very much, Brent. That was really uh, uh, packed with with information. I'm sure people want to digest those slides at their leisure when they're available. Our uh, our third presenter is Ewan Eady uh, from Ninewells Hospital and Medical School, University of Dundee, who will uh, speak on far UVC for the inactivation of airborne pathogens. Looks like your slides are up, and uh, you can take it away, Ewan. very much. So thank you for this opportunity um, to present here uh, today. The most important thing that I'm going to say today is, first of all, thank you to all of uh, my collaborators uh, on this research. They know who they are, and there is a list at the end of these slides as well. I've only got seven minutes, so I'm going to be talking fast. Um, you can play me back in half speed if you can't understand me uh, when the presentation and the recording comes out. And I'm going to be selective and very brief I would encourage you to take a look at our website uh, and at our YouTube channel for more uh, detailed information if you want. The, uh, I don't have any conflicts of interest, so that's the first disclosure. Uh, and really, I'm going to start the presentation um, with the end message, so the take home messages. So I'm going to be talking about far UVC, uh, and it is a fact that it will quickly inactivate pathogens in both the air and the surface in the laboratory setting, even in a big laboratory. And we already know, uh, as we've heard, that the upper room form of UVC at 254 nanometers has been proven to reduce transmission of airborne diseases in the real world. And so that leads us to the hypothesis that far UVC will also work in the real world. And if we switch to safety, we know for a fact that the wavelengths used in far UVC do not penetrate far into tissue. And we know that in humans, they don't cause acute reactions. Uh, and when we combine those two facts with uh, data from some mouse studies, we come to the hypothesis that it also won't induce any long-term adverse effects in the skin. So if we go uh, just right back into the basics of, of what ultraviolet uh, C is, um, so ultraviolet C is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and it covers the range from 100 nanometers to 280 nanometers. We don't get it from the sun down here on Earth. It gets absorbed in our upper atmosphere. Uh, and in fact, we're not really interested in wavelengths below 200 nanometers um, because they don't transmit through the air. So it's the 200 to 280 nanometer region we're interested in. It's the germicidal region where um, these photons can inactivate bacteria and viruses and stop the pathogens from replicating. The particular area that we are going to focus on that's called far UVC uh, is it's not actually an official term, um, but it's become to be known uh, the wavelength region between 200 nanometers and 230 nanometers. And by far the most common technology which has been explored in this area is the krypton chloride eczema lamp, which has a peak emission at 222 nanometers but also has some longer wavelength, lower uh, intensity emissions as well. Quick word on safety. So there are two um, organizations uh, who produced guidelines on limits of exposure to all types of ultraviolet. That's ICNRP and the ACGIH. They have slightly different um, guidelines, um, but the important thing is that you always have to consider all of the emissions um, from a lamp. I'm going to be talking about krypton chloride lamps uh, and on the slide here you can see the difference between unfiltered and highly filtered 
krypton chloride. And by filtering, what I mean is reducing those emissions above the 230 nanometers. So let's delve into a bit more depth into this first fact then. There is a wealth of evidence now um, showing that far UVC will work on both airborne and surface pathogens in the laboratory. You get very high log reductions for just a few millijoules per centimetre squared, much lower UV dose than is allowed in the exposure limits. And as I say, this is in laboratory, quite often um, small laboratory studies, but we have also looked at it in a larger sort of room-sized uh, laboratory where the lamps, when they were deployed, um, and we had continuous production of uh, aerosolized Staph aureus, depending on the intensity of lamps, we could get um, you know, somewhere between 128 and 322 equivalent air changes per hour, or in the medium scenario from 27 to 46 equivalent air changes per hour. And the link to that paper's at the bottom of that slide. Now, we know that far UVC works in the laboratory, uh, and we know it's roughly equivalent to the conventional 254 nanometer upper room UVC, again in the laboratory. But we know that the upper room UVC works in the real world. It's been almost 100 years since the first studies were done showing that it does reduce the transmission of airborne diseases in a real world scenario. So if the UVC works in the, the 254 works in the real world, and the 222 and 254 are the same in the laboratory, that brings us to the hypothesis that the far UVC will also work in the real world. And there are ongoing studies now um, to investigate that. Switching through to safety then, and we're concerned with wavelengths that are less than 230 nanometers. We know from computer modeling, we know from mouse studies, and we know from um, uh, human studies as well, that these wavelengths won't penetrate very far into tissue. And you can see some references on the slide, uh, which will be available in the handouts. We also know that um, if you appropriately filter the, the krypton chloride lamp to remove those longer wavelength UV emissions, that you don't get acute reactions in human skin until you get up to very, very high doses, doses which are higher than the exposure limits. So as I say, if you combine these facts with the mouse studies which have been done, which have looked to see if uh, mice would develop any long-term effects, and the mouse uh, didn't when they were exposed to the far UVC, then we come to the hypothesis that it's not going to, or it's not likely to induce adverse effects in the skin. More research is ongoing um, in this area. These are just some of the sort of research priorities. Uh, for me, I'd like to see some more real world efficacy studies. There's only been one published to date, but they are, I know they are coming. We'd like to see more on the interaction with the human eye. There's only one clinical study and um, be done and it is actually yet to report. And I think it'd also be useful to know how do you best deploy far UVC and make people aware of its limitations because at the start of the pandemic, there were a lot of products which came out, some of which would have been completely useless. So I'd encourage anybody uh, who's involved in research to get involved in research in this area. There's lots of questions to be answered. Again, those are my take home messages and I, uh, sorry for the briefness of it, but if you would like more information, please do visit our website, visit our YouTube channel, and thanks for listening. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Ewan, and to, to all of the presenters for those uh, great presentations to, to start off our uh, discussion. So um, now we'll introduce uh, three additional panelists who will uh, Help with the Q and A. Uh, we have Marwa Zatari, Dr. Marwa Zatari from Design Partners, and uh, uh, Professor Kevin Vandem Weilenberg uh, from the University of Oregon, and Dr. Catherine Ratliff from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And uh, in the interest of time, we will not go into their extensive qualifications. Uh, the, the speakers and the panelists. You can find their bios uh, at the the website. So, uh, with that, we will go to the, uh, the questions. And uh, perhaps uh, we should start with uh, some of the questions from the audience, since there are quite a few and, and um, many of them have to do with um, uh, some of the technologies we've been talking about. Um, uh, here's one to start with. How, how concerned should we be about avoiding crowded places like airplanes, movie theaters, uh, concerts, and uh, and classrooms. 
uh, maybe I'll send that one to uh, Dr. Zatari to begin with, and, and then others can add on. Uh, thank you, and hi, everyone. Um, I think the question is more um, um, what uh, type of uh, ventilation and filtration is there in these, in these uh, spaces? Um, this is an essential question. And we have been uh, providing guidance throughout the pandemic on how to uh, clean the air uh, for crowded spaces. So I would be concerned if there is no enough clean air coming from either ventilation or, or, or filtration. But it's hard just to say in a blanket statement without knowing um, the, the status of the air in, in, the, in these spaces. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, another question I think that maybe Andy could shed some light on is uh, uh, what proportion of densely occupied buildings in, in the US and other um, wealthy countries uh, versus lower income countries have good ventilation? Uh, can you speak to that at all, Andy? Sure, sure. I mean, I, I, I trimmed my slides back from an earlier presentation, and one thing that one bullet I took off is that, you know, actual airflow has been studied in a tiny, tiny fraction of the buildings that are out there, certainly not representative. So we really don't know, you know, and as Mara was referring to, you know, if you go into those crowded spaces, sure, you want a healthy ventilation rate and some good filtration, but but how do you know? You know, how do you know that that's being provided? And and I think that that's uh, one of many big questions. And any others like to add there? But if not, we'll go on to a, a question about CO two monitors. Um, uh, where should we put them? Uh, that that's one of the eternal questions about CO two monitors. Is 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 the monitor measuring what we want it to measure? Um, uh, perhaps, uh, Kevin, would you like to, to try that one? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think uh, practically you need to be able to see it and reach it, but I think ideally uh, it would be near return air grills where the where the air is getting sucked back out of the room. Uh, that's probably your best chance at a, at a re representative or integrated signal um, for the space. Oftentimes uh, you won't know what is the supply air or the return air just by looking. Um, so you'll need to check. It's often the dustier one, um, but that would be a, a good place to start. Right, thank you. Andy's got his, his hand up. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Kevin's answer makes total sense. You know, and I don't know exactly where to put them, but I know some places not to put them. You know, you don't want to put them in front of the supply vent because that's not going to tell you what's in the space. And you don't want to put them, you know, in, in front of the people's exhalations and, you know, there, there, there's some guidance out there, but not much. And there, there's some thoughts and there's been some studies, but that's a, a tough, tough question, but really important if you got this contraption where you put it. I have mine on my desk, but then I'm trying not to breathe on it. Um, all right, excellent. So our next question, uh, how closely should scientists work with industry partners in building air quality, uh, addressing possible financial conflicts of interest and desire to keep Price is high. I might ask uh, Dr. Ratliff to speak to this because you're involved in, in testing. Sure. Thanks for the question. Um, I think it's really important from an innovation standpoint to leverage all the expertise that we have across government, industry, academia. Um, one thing I would add on to that is that in order to truly advance these technologies, we need to have some better standardization of test methods. So we need to understand how one device works compared to another in a given setting and also how that um, testing can be extrapolated to real world settings. So I think you know, a priority needs to be to um, understand how to come together and get behind some standardized test methods. Yeah, thank you. And Andy, you'd like to add on there? Yeah, I mean, if the researchers don't talk to the people who design and operate and maintain buildings, you know, we're not, we're not gonna make any progress. We need to understand their world and so we can deliver our results to them in a way that's going to have some impact. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, and, and now a question about uh, UV and something we didn't really address, which is, is uh, surface cleaning with robots, which are usually used in unoccupied spaces. Is, is, are they effective? Uh, uh, perhaps uh, Ewan could, uh, could speak to this. Uh, yeah, so the, the robots, which are typically available at the moment, use the conventional 254 nanometer, 
uh, and are somewhat autonomous. Uh, they can go into a room and you can close the room off and, and they'll do their decontamination. Um, the, the, what they found from the studies in the hospitals is that those rooms have to be manually cleaned first. So you have to clean them first and then the UV is an adjunct on top of that um, to provide that sort of terminal uh, room cleaning. We don't think that 222 nanometers will be um, as effective because of um, it is highly absorbed by other uh, proteins and uh, anything else in the environment. So we don't think it will be as useful for surface cleaning as it is potentially going to be for, for air cleaning. So even if it's permanent installation, not, yes. not just a treatment. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. How do we convince medical professionals to accept aerosol transmission for all infectious respiratory diseases rather than large droplets? I, I'm not sure that's a question for this group, but someone asked it during our session. So who would like to step up and 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 address that? Well, Kevin, well I, I can just share a story about working with medical professionals, and it was transformative. They, I was working with some OB doctors uh, at a hot at the hospital, uh, do in labor and delivery early in the pandemic, and they were struggling to rank high enough in uh, in the in the structure to get higher quality PPE in the early days when it wasn't widely available and you know by collaborating with them and, and bringing their expertise to the equation we did aerosol trans or aerosol measurements in OB wards labor and delivery rooms uh, this even the surgery rooms and working with those medical professionals um, helped create some evidence uh, that aerosol uh, particles were in fact being uh, created in, in high abundance um, with viral load included in them during the labor and delivery process, uh, probably mostly from heavy breathing during labor and delivery, but also uh, was evidenced in the surgery rooms where it was a much more sedate um, environment. So I'd say collaboration is key. Okay, thank you. Um, to determine the best location of personal air cleaners and UVGI within a room, do we need to do CFD or is there a, a, a acceptably accurate procedure for uh, for good results? And, and because it, it mentions personal air cleaners, and I know Brent's thought about this, I think I will ask him to respond first. Yeah, I was going to ask you to respond, Bill. Um, I, I thought a lot about this. And um, as an engineer, I think the, it's very, it's like, it's, it's instinctive to say yes. Um, but I think the answer is practically no. So maybe theoretically, yes, if you really, really want to try to understand the dynamics of a space um, and how a portable air cleaner, for example, might interact with that, you need to know a lot about detailed um, uh, flow information and so forth. But a model won't really give you that necessarily, right? So colorful fluid dynamics is sometimes what CFD is referred to. And Andy told us how a lot about how much... Um, um, ventilation conditions vary in building over time and so forth. So you, you could actually get misled quite a bit by, by that sort of thing if you're outside of design conditions. So it can be useful, but technically, but practically often not. You could do detailed measurements of so forth uh, of, of each space. But as Andy's mentioned, you know, we would we just kind of need to do the basics in a lot of buildings. And so at the end of the day, other factors like, is there an outlet there? Is it too noisy? Does the airflow affect uh, people's uh, perception of comfort in the space end up kind of trumping a lot of these other factors? So uh, there is certainly a, a component and, and a, a space for design and commissioning. Um, but sometimes it just sort of doesn't matter. And if you can get these systems deployed uh, and enough of them, you can make an impact. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask you, and as we move perhaps in the direction of, of whole room uh, irradiation with, with far UV, is it going to become easier to, to specify uh, GUV systems because we don't have this problem of how much air is moving through the disinfection zone? Yes, yeah, so for far UVC, um, I wouldn't say that we're at a stage where we know exactly what the optimal um, UV concentration in the room would be. Um, but what I would say that is, is that it just makes common sense, sense that you, you flood the room with as much UV as possible to post staying within those exposure limits. Um, now that could end up being quite expensive because you might need lots and lots of lamps. Uh, and it might be that you can get away with fewer lamps. 
but err on the side of caution for the time being. Um, just take the approach of, of putting in enough that you don't exceed exposure limits and you cover as much of the room as you possibly can. Thank you. Another UV question, uh, what do we know about uh, UV and indoor air chemistry? Wouldn't UV start a lot of reactions that we don't necessarily want? Uh, is there someone here who's, who's uh, uh, strong on, on UV photochemistry? Something I'm, I'm, you'd like to address, Catherine or, or Brent? Yeah, I'm not, but I can speak to just kind of, I think where the state of the perspectives are there. Um, um, some of our outdoor air chemist, you know, colleagues published a perspective last year on indoor air chemistry from um, um, various air cleaning technologies and so forth. And, and I, I think it's what we know from outdoor air is that, yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, but I've seen, I, I think, I don't think I've seen any studies um, of, of for indoor air. So. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll say that uh, everyone should be interested in the new uh, National Academies report um, on why indoor chemistry matters. And in the, the management chapter, chapter five of that report, uh, this is discussed. And, and we found very scant literature on uh, UVC uh, reactions with, with uh, indoor surfaces or air chemistry. One paper on, on toluene that didn't seem to raise a lot of concerns, but maybe there are others. Yeah, Kevin? Yeah, I want to be careful to not, you know, rain on the parade of UV. I think it's an important strategy. And I've also worked a great deal on just normal irradiation, even that visible radiation, irradiation that comes through windows. And it can have beneficial effects as well. So I think it's absolutely an important tool in our sort of uh, layered risk reduction strategy. But I just want to open a little bit of a conversation about it and say, um, we want it to continue to work. We want it to continue to uh, inactivate the things that we want to inactivate. And there is some question about long-term unintended consequences. I'm not talking about viral resistance necessarily, or, but I'm just saying these, this is a solution that's an attack all solution. It's an additive strategy. It, it is going to you know, try to inactivate all microbes, uh, regardless of whether they're commensal or potentially even beneficial as we learn more about healthy indoor microbiome. So I just wanna say, we wanna apply it wisely. We wanna think about higher risk spaces. Perhaps we even wanna to start to open up conversations about now is the time to use it and maybe now isn't the time to use it, uh, which mean, means we need some input mechanisms to decide how and when to use it most wisely. Uh, Dr. Atla? Yeah, I just want to add to that it's not even just, you know, a chemistry or an emissions uh, standpoint that we might be concerned about, but there's also material compatibility things to think about, you know, as these indoor or interior surfaces are getting irradiated potentially constantly that could have degradating effects on the materials present. And, um, you know, to, to the points that have been previously made too, I think, um, considering things like the amount of particulate matter or other um, constituents in the air could potentially have an impact impact on how effective uh, UV could be in particular spaces. So all of these things need to be kept in mind when um, designing and deploying these. Um, yes, and there's also, there's, I'll mention there's an ASHRAE research project you can look up that looked at degradation of uh, materials at, at high levels of 254. Uh, Andy, quick one. Yeah, um, Kevin reminded me of one of my favorite points. Uh, and, and it's not specific to UV, but it's really specific to any new technology you know, particularly the more sophisticated ones. We don't do a good job keeping the old technology, you know, maintained and running properly. And so whenever I see somebody coming up with some whiz bang thing, I'm like, you know, that's, I love your brochures. That's beautiful. But, you know, we can't keep our, you know, our air conditioners running properly. So who's going to maintain that? You know, that's always a question. Yeah, I, I think we're getting close to our last question here. Maybe this will be the last one. Uh, another UV question. Well, there are studies on eye skin safety for far UV. It's categorized um, as UVC and is limited to only 23 millijoules exposure. I guess that's daily uh, dose. How, how should far UV be used in real life? That's uh, for, for you. And yeah, I mean, so interestingly, in, in the slide I showed with the, the medium scenario, um, that was equivalent to about 23 millijoules uh, per centimeter squared. 
if you were to be stood directly underneath the lamp for eight hours, um, which of course is highly unlikely. So, so ultimately the, the, an individual would get much lower dose than that. And even at that 23 millijoules per centimeter squared, there is still a 92% reduction in the pathogen load within the chamber, which, which is incredible. And actually the ACGIH has different uh, exposure limits uh, for the US mm -hmm. and it's up to around about, I think it's 146 millijoules per centimeter squared um, for that particular wavelength. Um, and that was the high scenario. And then there you were up at 98.4% reduction. So, I mean, fantastic uh, reductions, I think. Um, and even from the conservative estimates from, from what um, Shelley Miller was presenting earlier, I think, I think it was equivalent to four equivalent air changes per hour, and it still performed incredibly well. So, um, I've now lost my train of thought, but that was, that was the... Uh, uh, you you, good if the train has reached the station, we're going to have to, uh, to draw this to a close. So I, I want to thank everyone for their uh, their participation, both the presentations and the uh, the Q and A. I mean, a very quick summary. Uh, since we're up against time, I, I think we've seen that there are really a lot of good tools that we can use to uh, to help control uh, indoor pathogen exposures, and that we're making progress uh, in understanding the existing ones better and developing some new ones. So I think there's reason for a lot of optimism, but I think uh, we also heard two uh, important points. One was the uh, the buyer beware uh, uh, nature of, of Brent's uh, talk, that uh, there are a lot of products in the marketplace that need to really be scrutinized. And I think that's a direction we're heading with standards. And the other uh, was Andy's point that if we would just fix the buildings we have, that would be a pretty good start to, to addressing these problems. I could, could say more, but uh, we'll, we'll have to stop there and again. Thank you very much. And um, we're now going to take a break uh, until 1.30, unless the, uh, the uh, leaders give us a little extra time. Um, and when we come back, um, the, the next uh, session, session three, will be uh, moderated by Monica Shakspana from uh, Johns Hopkins uh, Center for Health Security. And with that, we'll, uh, we'll go on break and uh, see you in a few minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Monica Shockspana, a senior scholar with the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to session number three, entitled Organizational Change, Response, and Management in the Face of the Pandemic or Future Crisis. The goal of our session is to explore how organizations responded to the social and the technical challenges of managing indoor air quality to reduce risk for airborne transmission of pathogens. So our format's gonna follow an earlier pattern of having three distinguished speakers followed by panelists who will then react to what they've heard in the context of their own work uh, and or the workshop's larger themes. Um, I would encourage audience members to raise questions uh, via the Slido platform. So thank you for that. Um, let me introduce our first speaker. Um, uh, Dr. C.Y. Wu, who's professor in the Department of Environmental Engineering Sciences at the University of Florida. C.Y. is presenting on behalf of himself and also Dr. Faye McNeil, who's professor of chemical engineering and earth and environmental sciences at Columbia University. You'll see that the title of C.Y.'s chart and Faye's talk is Engineering Innovation and messaging to support decision-making for minimizing exposure risk to infectious virus aerosol. So CY, I just wanna make sure you've turned your camera on um, and unmuted yourself and I, the, the screen is shared. And uh, please remember that you and the other speakers each have about seven or so minutes for your presentation, leaving time for a rich discussion. Uh, thanks uh, CY, over to you. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and good afternoon. 
Uh, we are very honored to have this opportunity to share our thoughts about engineering and, and uh, innovation and the messaging to support the decision making. Okay. So uh, the first one we want to talk about is uh, messaging. And a simple, clear, accurate message is very important to public health. So let's say I wanted to talk about the importance of ventilation. And so among the three scenarios shown over here, which one do you think has a higher uh, virus aerosol concentration? Is it a uh, patient room? Is it a fitness center or self-isolation room? I think uh, to uh, be surprised to many people, uh, actually, uh, excuse me, let me just, uh, okay. uh, surprising to many people, an isolation room actually has a higher uh, concentration. Let me show the results over here. And because it has a very low air change per hour, on the other hand, the uh, COVID patient room and fitness center, they have a much higher uh, air change rate and therefore low concentration. So I hope uh, this kind of a very short message and the image will uh, stick better. And then another uh, thought is the importance of the information availability, which actually has been uh, touched upon earlier. I recall in March, 2020, and uh, I was talking to uh, our doctors at the student healthcare center about the possibility of aerosol transmission. And uh, their response at that time was, eh, really? Okay, so I said, well, how about this? Let's do some air sampling at your place. And we placed our sampler uh, three meters away from evaluation room where uh, the uh, symptomatic uh, uh, students are seen by, were seen by the uh, doctors. And then uh, the evidence of the virus in our sample uh, available on the next day immediately changed their mind. So all the staff will switch from surgical mask originally to uh, wearing N95. And also the respiratory ward operation was moved to outdoors. And remember at this time, there was uh, this was way before CDC provided any guidelines uh, how to uh, better protect the workplace. So, uh, uh, people do make a, a wise decision uh, when information is available. And uh, uh, next, uh, another example is about the, the droplet versus the aerosol transmission, which uh, uh, the, uh, Professor Milton uh, also pointed out earlier. And uh, uh, so in the beginning, uh, the WHO's medical experts were not convinced about the aerosol transmission when there were uh, virus RNA data available for the airborne uh, SARS-CoV-2. So after we have been able to collect and present the viable SARS-CoV-2 uh, collected more than uh, two meter away, and we also show that the uh, genome sequences of the air sample exactly match with the corresponding sequences of the virus isolated from the patient, then these uh, medical experts uh, got alerted and started to change their mind. So again, the importance of uh, available information. And another important lesson learned uh, uh, in communication is that we need to understand that the same, uh, the same term may mean very different things in different disciplines, in different societies, and different cultures. So I recall uh, when I first started working on uh, collecting uh, flu virus aerosol, and I was instructed by my uh, medical colleagues that, oh, aerosol particles are less than five micrometer. And uh, uh, this is, well, my response at that time is, huh, why, why is that? Because in my environment engineering training and the definition of aerosol is not by that simple size. Um, and the professor Lindsay Marr has a great article explaining how the medical field derived this fine micro, and which is uh, just very mysterious to engineering uh, professional like me. Uh, and uh, it has been inquired about whether regulations policy or technology innovation is more important. And uh, we would argue that uh, uh, actually both are complemented to each other. So let me show one example, which is uh, the on the spot detector for the SARS-CoV-2 or influenza virus aerosol developed by uh, Professor Hugh Finn at our university, University of Florida. So this is uh, to show that you can get to be positive for SARS-CoV-2 and for 
uh, the flu virus. So just imagine you have such a tool in your place that will definitely help you make a decision because you know there is uh, such a virus at your place or not. And then another uh, very often decision makers do not have all the information they need to help them make a decision. And one example is the uh, air change uh, per hour in the naturally ventilated buildings. So in that case, uh, engineers can come to help develop methods to get them past that roadblock and help support the decision making process. So one good example is the use of carbon dioxide sensor, which has been pointed out earlier, and for the naturally ventilated space. And this shows uh, the examples of for the classroom and a bucking uh, event to determine the uh, ventilation rate. Okay. Uh, and this uh, method was not available and it was developed uh, before, uh, it was not available before COVID and it was developed during the pandemic by engineers because of the needs of the, the facility managers. So next, now with such a tool, we can then better understand how our school buildings are doing in terms of the indoor air quality and the, the associated uh, exposure risk, hopefully. And the left-hand side shows that uh, in the Northeast uh, United States, the natural ventilation is not that good and needs to be supplemented with air filtration or other technology as pointed out in uh, prior, previous sections. But on the other hand, the uh, in the, uh, West Coast, it's, a, it's very different. The natural ventilation actually was much better. The natural ventilation in the old building is much better than the new buildings that are equipped with a mechanical uh, ventilation. So with this tool, it allows us to see the geographical difference, which is a very important piece of the information when we try to set the right policy. And uh, next, let me illustrate another good use of uh, new technology. So uh, the use of this uh, carbon dioxide monitoring uh, actually showed uh, in a cl uh, music classroom, actually showed a very high concentration during practice, which was after hours when the facilities did not expect people to be there, but there were people trying to do the practice and uh, they turned off ventilation at that time. So once the data became available, the facility manager adjusted the ventilation schedule. And you can see on the right-hand side, you have a, a much lower uh, carbon dioxide concentration in the green by the green color. So this shows how it can help uh, uh, facility managers to really uh, you know, make a decision to improve the air quality. So hopefully uh, with the above slides, I, we can have some uh, take home messages. Uh, the first one is a simple, clear and accurate message is very important to uh, public health. And the second one is, most people will make a wise decision when relevant information is provided to, to them. And the uh, third lesson is uh, do not assume everyone uses the same language and the definition. And uh, the last one is that regulation policy and the technology uh, innovation are complementary to each other. Uh, decision makers uh, often lack some of the information that need to make decisions. And in that case, engineering innovation can help provide solution that supports the decision-making process. And another important point is that we should build trust with the community by engaging the community in collecting and sharing the data. Here is the list of uh, the references we use and uh, uh, they will be available to the uh, audience. And finally, before I stop, I would like to acknowledge the uh, financial support from different agencies and also a lot of collaborators who made the discovery possible. And if you have any questions, definitely do not hesitate to contact X. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, CY, and also Faye for that um, engaging presentation. Our second speaker is Dr. Sandra Kraus Quinn, who's a professor and chair of the Department of Family Science and also senior associate director of the Maryland Center for Health Equity at the School of Public Health um, with University of Maryland College Park. Uh, Sandra, if you would please turn on your camera, unmute yourself and share your screen. Um, and I think the relevant part of Sandra's title is, and it follows nicely from CY and Faye's presentation, 
that social context matters. Okay, and I think that the staff is going to share my slides. So social context matters. We have heard a lot about the technology. We, we have heard a lot about what is possible. Um, and yet, we need to be thinking about the social and broader context. So I'm So I'm not clear who's doing the slides here. Can you see your second slide? No, I don't see any of them. Audrey, we're seeing a list of files of PowerPoint. Thank you. So I'll keep talking while we're getting the slides. We know that there are a number of challenges to implementing the kinds of technology that would help us to protect human health. And let me just put a broader context on them. We've been talking about some of the engineering challenges. But many of you are going to be representing or are part of large organizations, and our audience may be part of large organizations who have resources who can garner resources, who may have the technological advancements you know, available to them, may control their own building space and can implement change. When you're talking about, and I'm gonna use some examples from smaller spaces, small school systems, local churches, community health organizations, small businesses, that do not have the resources fiscally. They may not control or own their own space, so they can't make significant changes in some of the systems like HVAC. They may be in old facilities where they can't open windows. So that's a context that becomes a health equity and social justice issue. But there's more. How about all the stakeholders, be they in churches, be they in big business, be they in government? Next slide, please. So I want to share a, um, an example, two examples, really, of the human and social context in two different emergencies that involved airborne transmission. One is the anthrax attack of 2001, in which anthrax was found in three large postal facilities, largely staffed by minority workers and then today's pandemic. So in anthrax, there was a terrible relationship between management and labor that predated the anthrax attack. There was zero trust between the two entities. Today, we know that we have misinformation, disinformation, polarization that has led to limited trust in large segments of our population. In both cases, anthrax and COVID, we have a novel agent. We also have, in many ways, novel ways of mitigating the risk. And, and so our communities, our workers, et cetera, may not understand either the risk or some of the mitigation. What does all this do? It increases their perceived risk. So this is some of the, the human context. Next slide. And I'll just say that, you know, we know in this, this quote states it, that it's critical to consider the human factors, the values, the behaviors, the concerns, the information needs. Next slide. So I'm gonna give you an example of a small environment. So the Maryland Center for Health Equity since 2012 has worked with local black barbershops and beauty shops in the DC area in Baltimore. We work with local churches and other organizations. So the minute the coverage of the COVID started, we were hearing from the barbers and stylists, here are the questions they're getting, here were their fears. Remember, barbers and stylists can't work remotely. They have to lay their hands on their clients. So we were hearing their questions, their concerns, and we took them seriously. So we started something that continues to today 
and that is virtual town halls. Dr. Milton was part of them several times. Um, people, researchers working on the vaccine clinical trials, healthcare providers, policymakers, and lots of community members where they could each talk to one another. That made a difference in starting to build trust and reduce misinformation. Dr. Milton, you know, has been an amazing partner with us. So early on, he made sure that we had saliva tests in our shops. He helped to make sure we had masks in our shops. And with everything that was introduced in these shops, what happens? It becomes an opportunity for dialogue and building trust. As time went on, our undergrad students, again, with some support from Dr. Milton's team, our undergrad students built Corsi Rosenthal boxes. And they have now been, you see them in a couple of the, the shops, but they're in churches. They're even going to Encore Creativity for older adults, which is where older adults sing. And we have Corsi Rosenthal boxes at those rehearsals and concerts. So all of this points to what I think are sort of the critical lessons. Next slide. Engineering is part of the solution. We know that and the extent to which we can do things that are passive and don't you know, make big demands on um, people, that's good. But we also know what is critical is ongoing, respectful, bi-directional communication that joint planning needs to include everyone in a meaningful way so that their concerns are listened to and that they can um, be part of the solution. Every opportunity we've had to introduce unfamiliar ways to mitigate risk has become an opportunity for, the, for further dialogue and for building trust. And that's essential, whether you're in a large corporation or in a local uh, community setting. And finally, I need to come back to what is near and dear to the to many of our hearts is that the issue of improving air quality and reducing airborne transmission is also a matter of ensuring health equity. And that is a critical issue considering who has been disproportionately impacted. So I will stop there. Next slide and uh, turn it back to Monica. Thank you, Sandra, for that um, wonderful and eye-opening talk about the importance of uh, the human or social systems um, uh, in, in this uh, challenging environment. Our third speaker is Reverend Anthony Evans, who is the president of the National Black Church Initiative, uh, which is a coalition that includes um, over 150,000 churches in the United States. Um, so Reverend Evans, please, I see that your camera is on uh, and you're unmuted, which is great. Um, and either you or staff are going to share slides. Let me make yeah, sure those they, can get, go, they get up. They can go to the first slide. <clears throat> Yeah, Reverend Anthony Evans, president of the National Black Church Initiative, a coalition of 150,000 churches. When COVID first ha happened, we started mobilizing. The uniqueness of NBCI is that we are a health initiative and can be considered the largest faith-based African-American health initiative in the country. We're starting critical education and um, information to our congregations over the past 30 years. By doing so, we had the trust of our congregation, which constitute 27.7 million African-Americans in terms of that type of stuff. You can go to the next slide, the first slide. So the, the bottom line came down to how do we respond to COVID? And we responded to COVID um, just like we responded to all crises in the African-American community. Um, what we did not have is two factors, and this plays out to today. We inefficient resources in terms of money. Uh, and the second thing we did not have was information, critical information. And I think even a third thing that we did not have, but we corrected it. And that is um, critical health personnel who was able to give some direction. Um, 
so what how we approach um, this um, end um, air situation, but first we had to deal with the virus and we did not know the transmission of the virus. Of course, we listened very closely to CDC and the rural health organizations. And even today, our churches are experiencing outbreaks largely because they are unable to follow those rules and regulations to the T. Six weeks, ap um, six feet apart, isolation if you got the virus, um, stay at home. Um, but we have remarkably adapted to um, this crisis that we have had in our country. And now, of course, we are adapting to the monkeypox and other um, air pollutants that we are unfamiliar with. Remember, we are a faith-based organization, not a scientific organization, but what we had an advantage of is that we were familiar with health healthcare information, critical healthcare information, how to get it, which was most important, and then how to share it. So we didn't sit back as a community, but the country continued to sit back. And this is not to complain, but it, the evidence is very clear to us what happened during COVID. And when the um, numbers come out in terms of the um, modality, as well as the um, um, death and dying in the African-American and Latino community, no one will be surprised. We will constitute a large block of that uh, due to um, health equity, um, due to the fact that this country still have not learned how to share resources with minority community in a timely, fast way. And we're talking about technical assistance, we're talking about uh, money resources, and we're talking about material. I believe that the Black church has been remarkable response in this red here uh, to the fact that we have gotten to the first phase, if we can say that um, scientifically, of COVID, and now we're entering to a second phase of COVID and maybe a third phase. Our response in the second phase is a little bit more robust. What we have done is that we have taken the steps to consult with experts around the country in terms of airborne um, diseases like COVID. Um, so, and what we are doing in New York and New York State, particularly the Bronx, at Mount Bethel uh, Baptist Church. Um, and next slide, please. Um, under the uh, um, leadership of Dr. Kendricks is the fact that um, we have um, inaugurated and sent a sample of the first virus suppression church. So what does that mean? That means that this congregation have decided that they will participate in a year long study on how to suppress the virus in their church. That mean improving um, the, the air quality of the church. That mean improving the protocols, COVID protocols of the church. That means changing the AVAC system of the church. And that also mean um, in, um, training um, uh, modifying um, behavior. So this congregation of 300 people that we'll be monitoring throughout the, this year, starting in September and going to next September, we're going to completely physically reorganize their church. We're going to put in new air conditions that that is close to whatever industry standard to uh, reduce um, virus suppression there is. We are going to put in um, air, air, um, um, air uh, fresh air uh, monitors um, in the church. We're going to work very closely with the New York uh, State, um, State EPA and the New York Health Department to measure effectively how well we do this. We're going to provide training, education, protocol. We're going to provide PPEs to every member of the uh, congregation. Every member of the congregation will be subject to tests once every three months. So every member of the congregation will have about six to nine tests by the time, uh, six to eight tests uh, 
four to six tests, depending upon their likelihood. Um, um, they have agreed to um, be vaccinated. This congregation, I can proudly say, is vaccinated at 98%. And, and that's in, in, in connection with our 100% congregation vaccine program that we launched. And we want to um, thank J&J um, &J for a small grant to make that happen. We also launched the Vax News, which is our newspaper that gives a point by point protocol to our members on how to suppress the virus. So in this particular situation, as we have moved from first phase in terms of controlling the virus and getting the vaccine to the second phase in terms of improving the uh, air quality in our churches, also improving the protocol to suppress the virus. Our point is, is that if we can take Mount Bethel uh, of Bronx, New York, and, and install these particular virus suppressing measures that we can share it with other faith communities around the country. And this is one area that the government do not have to be concerned. Of course, we are not doing this on our own. We are consulting with the experts. No one told us to do this. And let me repeat this. No one told us to do this. This is a reaction that we have to do as clergy for the betterment of our congregation. And for this situation, it will be the betterment for the entire society. Because if we are successful in suppressing the virus by making, um, by instituting these measures, I guarantee you large venues will follow our protocol to make sure that they are safe within their venue as well. So we're looking at air quality, we'll be looking at um, behavior modification, we'll be providing, providing a physical remake of the church AVAC system. Um, we're going to be testing the outside air as well as the inside air. We're gonna do a comparative analysis. We're going to follow 300 people for a year in terms of their behavior, in terms of virus suppression. We're going to test them. We're going to ask them to wear masks at the church. We're going to reduce singing at the church. We're going to do a number of um, actions to suppress the virus. And we're going to share that data with the general public. So thank you. And I'll look forward to answering questions along with my distinguished colleagues that I've been able to provide this with. Thank you so much, Reverend you. Evans. Um, uh, you and your two uh, previous speakers have really talked about the integration of human systems, biological systems, and engineering systems. And we have to pay attention to that complexity. Um, I would like to invite our panelists uh, to join me virtually. Um, uh, so we have Mr. Nick Starkey, who's Director of Policy at the Royal Academy of Engineering in the United Kingdom. Uh, he leads the National Engineering Policy Center. We have Ms. Peg Seminario, uh, the former now retired Safety and Health Director for the AFL-CIO, that is the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations, and Mr. Dave Rousen, who's the Director of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Indoor Environments Divisions, uh, Division. Uh, so if our panelists could uh, turn on your cameras and unmute yourselves. What we're going to do in this part of the session is have each of you take about two minutes to react to what you've heard in the context of your own work um, or your perspectives uh, in relation to the workshop themes. Um, and again, I'd encourage the audience to register uh, questions on the Slido platform so we can incorporate them into the conversation. So uh, Nick, Mr. Nick Starkey, if you could kick us off with your comments, please. Very happy to, thank you very much. It's great to join you. Um, for somebody who's director of policy at an engineering organization, actually the first thing I reacted to most positively was what Sandra said, that engineering is a part of the solution, but only a part of the solution and communication with people is really essential. We did a study for our UK um, national security, uh, chief scientific advisor, um, on how to make buildings infection resilient. And what we found 
which is actually levels of knowledge about how to manage your building for um, infection resilience are quite low. Um, and that people simply react to what you complain about very often and people don't know that they um, need to uh, understand ventilation um, people won't complain about how many air changes an hour happen in the building so people do the things which are visible to them they put alcohol gel out they make sure the place is clean that reassures people but they don't know that the ventilation is doing them harm so um, uh, I completely agree that both information for the public and also people information for people who are managing the building who may or may not be very expert. We spoke to people with extremely sophisticated systems, the chief engineering place, but many buildings are operated relatively casually by somebody who's got a different job as well. Um, and so uh, giving people just basic engineering habits of mind to assess the risk in their space, to understand their space and make sensible interventions are really important. Um, and finally, to achieve a really fundamental change in the way our buildings are built and managed, I think we need to take a systems approach so that we um, fundamentally change uh, the system so that we're in a better place for the next pandemic. That means clear standards. So we're thinking at the design of a building, thinking of it as a place which keeps people safe so that it's uh, infection resilience is on the radar of uh, regulators as quite often it isn't at the moment and um, people uh, will have a squeeze button on them for carbon monoxide but they won't necessarily have a squeeze button on them for um, whether the uh, building is um, uh, infection resilient um, and, and, and finally that we have good education for people. Thanks so much Nick. Um, Peg, I'm inviting you to share your reflections at this point. Um, first, I just want to thank uh, the folks who put this uh, workshop together and then this panel has been terrific and very inspiring. So thanks all of you for all of your terrific work. Uh, you know, let me just say that working with the unions during this pandemic and, you know, previous uh, outbreaks, et cetera, um, the, the frustration of trying to get action on things that we know has been, you know, incredibly, incredibly uh, frustrating. And, and one thing that I think is really critical for all of us doing this work right now is, you know, to emphasize that this pandemic is not over, the risk is not passed. Uh, CDC came out with their new guidelines last week and said it's up to you as an individual to do this. And included in that was ventilation. It was good that they included ventilation, but what's really troubling here is there still needs to be a public health approach. Uh, organizational approach and an organizational responsibility. And I think that where we need to go is uh, to keep pushing that and that it's not up to just individuals to do this, it's up to those responsible parties to take action. Uh, and our job is to help them do that. And as Nick said, providing them the information, but the basic tools, I mean, some of this is really beyond a lot of folks, but there are a lot of people out there that wanna do the right thing. Uh, and so I think we have to look in this space of those that are trying to deal with this pandemic on the ground and give them the information and the tools. And it's most important to target that to those populations that are really at high risk. We know, uh, as everyone on the panel has said, that there are populations and there are groups who have been very impacted in this pandemic and they continue to be. I mean, the infections are still predominantly you know, much higher rates in Latinos and Blacks uh, here in the United States. And that's gonna to continue to be the case because those people are still the most exposed, the most at risk and have the least control over how to manage their environment. And so it's our job to basically target some of these efforts, not only the outreach, but also the, um, you know, the practice uh, into those communities where it can make the most difference. Um, so again, thanks to folks and it's great to be with all of you today. Thanks so much, Peg. Uh, Dave, we'd love to hear your reactions uh, and your commentary, please. Thank you, Monica. Just uh, briefly by way of introduction again, um, uh, I am the director of EPA's Indoor Environments Division. And uh, so as I participate in today, you'll hear um, some uh, flavor of me speaking as a, as a member of the of the uh, the federal government and sort of how how our role plays um, uniquely 
in the uh, COVID-19 response and in sustainable efforts to try and improve uh, the built environment uh, to prevent uh, airborne transmission of pathogens and other pollutants. Um, although I'll also be speaking uh, generically as a, as a member of the, the greater public. Um, my division uh, uh, is responsible for non-regulatory uh, guidance uh, for homes, schools, offices, and, and commercial buildings. Um, and as we've been engaged uh, along multiple fronts, I think one of the things I want to emphasize is, is um, the unique opportunity that exists now, I think, to dramatically improve uh, general public understanding, um, uh, private folks in their homes, as well as all the different entities that, that uh, um, as, uh, as uh, Sandra was mentioning, uh, impact um, uh, the built environment, the critical role that uh, indoor air quality plays in health and well-being. Um, there's a unique opportunity here to scale up proven engineering controls and practices, to fast track innovative research and development, uh, and to mobilize public and private assets to make sustained, sustained improvements to indoor air quality, not just a once in the moment uh, change to help address the COVID pandemic, but long-term sustained improvements in the built environment. Um, the, uh, we've heard throughout this workshop, significant public health gains can be achieved by improving building ventilation, filtration, and air cleaning. And those kinds of improvements are, are not only a critical component of addressing the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but well-managed IAQ has multiple co-benefits. Um, not just airborne viruses and other pathogens, but also reductions in PM, uh, volatile organic compounds and other pollutants in buildings, re resulting in a range of important health performance, productivity and economic benefits, um, including uh, children's education and, uh, and uh, um, life, uh, quality of life improvements over the long term. Um, where we sit, um, it, 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 it's, it's apparent that professional organizations, HVAC-related industries, trade unions, um, they've been on the front lines, building owner, uh, managers, facility managers. They're doing things to mobilize resources to help those responsible for operating, upgrading, maintaining buildings. Um, and, and from where we sit in the federal government, the early signals are the federal funds that came through the American Rescue Plan are being used to support ventilation and other indoor air quality improvements. There's encouraging action there, but there remains important and significant work to do to help schools and other buildings improve indoor air. And um, as we were saying earlier, to educate, help and support families, particularly from an equity perspective. Uh, to improve ventilation and indoor air quality in their homes. Great, thanks so much for sharing those uh, comments and reflections. Um, I'm gonna pull some of our um, pressing questions from the audience. Um, and why don't we start with Nick? Uh, what regulations or incentives are used in the United Kingdom to improve operations and maintenance of buildings so that they perform up to standards? Oh, it's a great question, um, and it might be useful to think about the different life stages of a building in doing that, in the design stage, the construction stage, and in use. Um, and often the performance of a building in terms of ventilation and keeping the population within it healthy flies under the radar. We're working with BSI, or speaking with the BSI, which is the main standards body in the UK, um, about whether we can um, develop some more meaningful standards um, on infection resilience so they can be embedded into the design of uh, buildings because at the moment there's a, a, a paucity of standards so you know what good looks like in the first place. Um, building regulations cover the design and construction of most buildings in the, uh, in the UK. There are things about health in the building regulations but we think they can be made very much more visible so there's an explicit responsibility to um, construct a building which um, has a functional requirement to provide an adequate indoor environment for the inhabitants um, and to pull that out and make it an explicit part of the building regulations. At the moment, it's quite scattered. Then once a building is in use, 
um, quite often local authority inspection uh, is what keeps um, uh, it, it being used properly. Um, and there's a need for in-use regulations um, so that local authorities um, know what they're inspecting against and so that the performance of the building um, uh, in terms of ventilation and in terms of the general health of the, occupation, uh, the occupants is a higher priority um, when the building is inspected. Thanks so much. And I'm going to invite Peg into this conversation. We just heard sort of a United Kingdom uh, uh, presentation. But Peg, you've been a thought leader in occupational health and safety for a long time and know the importance of uh, productive regulatory systems. I was wondering if you might give us a, a US perspective. Well, I think the, the approach uh, should be similar here to the US as what Nick has laid out. The question is, how do you do that and get there? Because we have both a federal system and we have a state system and uh, we also have a system of codes in this country and so i think we have to look and identify uh you know in each of these areas here uh, as to uh what kind of standards so be very clear as to what we're talking about here as far as uh, you know the, take the recommendations and turn them into requirements particularly focusing on some of the new buildings going on i think we need to look at that also in the context of all the money that's gonna be coming into uh, energy efficiency, decarbonization, uh, and link that up. And I think uh, importantly, how do we deal with the existing building stock and particularly in those areas where we have buildings that have no ventilation whatsoever. Uh, and um, you know, there are regulations and regulations in this country have been what have moved environmental protections, whether it's the general environment, air pollution, the workplace. And so I think we need to think about what kind of regulations. And in the workplace, I, I think uh, we could develop those regulations. The problem is there's been a lot of pushback to having anything mandatory in place. So I think we have to get over that hurdle. We recognize that we do need standards uh, and we need oversight and enforcement as well. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, and Dave, if, if there's anything additional you want to um, add to this part of the conversation, you're certainly welcome to. Well, I, I guess one of the, the, the points I, I would add is that, um, and it's something Peg uh, and, and Nick have touched on, is that um, oftentimes uh, the standards and codes for new buildings um, are, are the ones that get uh, have the highest adherence rates. Um, and then soon thereafter, um, the way we operate our buildings um, uh, declines. So we, we've been having some conversations across the federal government about what could be the best innovations to advance the way uh, indoor air quality, uh, ventilation and filtration in buildings. And we often come back to, well, the biggest innovation would be to get buildings operated the way they were designed. Um, and sustain that. Uh, so um, I think, uh, you know, some of that happens through standards and regulations. Some of that happens by increasing overall societal awareness of the importance of good indoor air quality, the importance of effective ventilation filtration, driving the sustained practices by building and facility managers. Great. Thanks, Dave. That's a great segue to another uh, question from our audience. Uh, any recommendations for effective communication uh, of indoor air quality importance as a visitor, a customer, a community member, as we go about our daily activities? Um, I think the communication piece was touched on by CY and also Sandra. So why don't we pull you into this discussion? Um, let's talk about effective communication about indoor air quality. Uh, CY, do you want to start? And then, um, uh, Sandra, why don't you follow? Sure. Um, I think uh, communication is important, as I pointed out. And how do you really do that? I very often proactively talk to uh, people with different background. And uh, definitely in the beginning, we are using different languages. And sometimes we don't understand each other. But just by talking more and more, we get to, to know each other better. And that's also how I started the collaboration with, uh, 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 say, in uh, public health, with the medicals, or, or with the other uh, different types of uh, engineering. 
Uh, and this is not limited to inside the university. If we wanted to work with uh, the community, we definitely needed to, you know, talk to, to the local communities and uh, understand what they understand, and we can, uh, you know, really solve the problem together. So proactive, uh, proactively, uh, you know, approaching others, I think, is very important. Great, thank you, Sandra. I would just build on that with saying, first, I concur. I think it is an ongoing process of really engaging with um, community groups, with workers inside a building, um, and learning. You know, for many people until the pandemic, I would say probably indoor air quality was really a matter of are you too cold or too hot in a big building? I mean, that's sort of how people thought about it. It was invisible in many ways to many of us. So I think there's really initially of what is indoor air quality and asking them what they know, what they understand about it, what their concerns are. You know, when we talk about MERV filters, when we talk about much of the language that we've heard today, that's like a foreign language to, to most of us. So I think we start with the basics. What does it mean? Why is it important? And asking workers in the building, work community members, you know, about this and helping use using that to help fashion our communication with them. Thanks very much. Uh, Dave, let's you've got your hand up. Let's go to you and then I want to bring uh, Reverend Evans uh, into this conversation. Uh, Dave? Yes, um, I, I want to actually uh, sort of refer to something uh, Reverend Evans said earlier that uh, how much uh, trust plays a, a role, I think, in the in the area of communications and some of the unique challenges that we were presented with COVID um, that um, that undermine that had the potential to undermine trust. Um, one is some of the uh, factors in American society today. But the other interesting thing was how um, rapidly what we understood about COVID evolved as we rapidly tried to provide guidance. And so some of the early guidance that, that came out by uh, some authorities, it we learned more and learned that that needed to change. And that um, while everyone was doing their best to try and provide the best information available, um, that with COVID, um, I think, um, caused folks to be um, less compliant with guidance as we went through um, the pandemic. Um, so there's only so much you can do around that, but it's paying attention to how we communicate in order to build trust is critically important and trying to be as transparent as we can for inform with information. I think these are lessons learned from this pandemic for as we go forward in dealing with other pathogens and as speakers have talked about, the long haul of changing public awareness and perception about the importance of indoor air quality. People, I think, are just beginning to realize or think we spend 90% of our time in buildings. It's where we do all our living and breathing, and it has a huge impact on our health and well-being now and for life. And I think that's something to build on here to make long-term sustained improvements in public health. Great. Thanks, Dave. Um, Reverend Evans, um, we've earlier, uh, folks have spoken about technological innovation, but your initiative speaks to social innovation. I was wondering if you could talk about your partnerships with uh, technical experts, um, you know, because what you're suggesting or what you're offering is, is at least from one woman's opinion, uh, very innovative to find answers to the indoor air quality question. Absolutely. <laughs> Mon King said in a sermon, um, prior to his death in terms of the debate between religion and science. Um, as you well know, that has been the debate over the centuries, but now there is a, there is a marriage now between issue that confronts us today. Um, the society needs the church and the church needs society. So that need to be pointed out. The second point of that is that 
um, we have reached out prior to anyone saying to us, especially the black church that you need to look at air quality ventilation um, on all of these issues, largely because of the fact that you have an entity like NBCI who understands the applications of science. So therefore we needed to bring in the expert way, way early before there was a crisis. Um, and so we have partnered with IBEC, we have partnered with uh, um, Dr. James LeBlanc, who is a PhD in air quality. So all of these factors, and we are uh, broadening our scientific arm here. And as we reach out to the New York uh, EPA and the New York Health Department, we'll be um, that at which of the university, we, we, we're like the girl with the pretty yellow skirt on. We have three universities who wanna be a part of our church suppression project because they know it's groundbreaking and the data that comes out of there can really begin to shape some um, public policy. Um, and and as, as we do this, of course, we are reaching, we are, we are creating a platform for a cooperative relationship going forward with the scientific community about how, how the church operates. The church in the school has to be safely operated if you're going to have a society. So we know the schools will be taken care of. No one is in that church space right now but us in dealing with this question. And we sort of pioneers about it. And therefore, by the National Academy of putting this panel on the air quality is a step ahead in helping us to push that argument. So we look forward to interacting with all of our new colleagues um, as we go forward to do this. I just suffice it to say, what we, what's going to come out of this um, process will be a handbook. As you well know, Monica, we've been trying to work that handbook for quite a while now. Will be a handbook for churches in terms of a step-by-step -step guide based on good scientific data by the experts. So this is this will be a great marriage. And I think Martin King would sermon would have come to fruition that there's no tension between religion and science. Great. Thank you so much, Reverend Evans. We are coming up uh, to the close of our uh, session. I just want to pull out a few uh, takeaways. Uh, we spoke earlier about Paying attention to the, uh, uh, the ways in which uh, human systems, engineering systems, and biological systems are, are integrated um, uh, and to follow those interactions. Um, we heard about the importance of information, uh, heads of organizations and as decision makers and also individuals as decision makers and household uh, heads. Uh, and uh, communication was a theme that came up over and over again. Uh, Sandra pointed out the importance of respectful, bi-directional communi uh, in, uh, communication. Um, and, uh, and we've also talked a little bit about um, the need to move beyond the individual, uh, individual behavior to these larger systems um, where there, there is guidance, there are standards, there are regulations, uh, and we need to sort of be intervening at different um, levels in terms of, uh, of uh, social units. So I wanna thank our speakers and our panelists and also for our audience for their wonderful questions. And I'm gonna turn the mic over to John, uh, who's going to moderate our fireside chat. Take care, Great. everyone. Uh Thanks so much, Monica, and I think everybody knows this is going to be a very virtual fireside chat, uh, but the goal is to have a conversation about what we've heard with um, a look forward. Uh, we've heard about um, many uh, things that we can do and are not doing. We've heard about the barriers to getting them done, and here we uh, will be looking at how to move uh, forward, uh, what might be the agenda, and how uh, leadership might be taken of such an agenda. Our panels uh, includes some um, individuals whom you've already um, met, uh, Bill, Peg, um, 
And Dave, we're also joined by Tomas Aragon from the California Department of uh, Public Health, John Howard uh, from NIOSH uh, CDC, uh, Sean Ryan uh, from the US EPA, and Brooke Bozick uh, from NIH National Institute for Allergy and Infectious um, Diseases. So what we're gonna do first is uh, for our panelists, give you about two minutes max uh, to respond to what has been a, a very full three um, sessions, and then we'll take on uh, these general charges and uh, whatever else our participants would like to um, pose. <clears throat> I'll give you a warning at, at two minutes, if you could just um, uh, end then. So Peg, let's uh, kick off with you. Um, you know, thanks, John. Um, just to really continue from the, the last discussion, because I think it's in, important that as we're moving forward here, we're looking at how to implement and move forward on what we know now. I mean, the research has really been terrific and continues to be important, but we know a lot now. Uh, and how do we move that into the workplaces, into the churches, into the schools uh, where it's actually going to uh, you know, matter uh, and uh, protect people? Uh, and so I think you know, going back to having the clear guidance uh, and the standards that give people the foundation from which to work from, give them the tools that they can use, uh, as the Reverend said, you know, next steps as to how, you know, how do we move forward and in our locations uh, on this. But the other thing we need to do is we need to be reaching out further than we have already uh, to others who, uh, who also are involved in this space. So it's not just the scientists and the environmental scientists, uh, it's those that write the codes, uh, it's those that implement the codes. It's all of those who are working in areas right now dealing, as I said earlier, on the issues of energy efficiency and decarbonization. We're going to have billions of dollars coming into this economy to upgrade buildings, to you know, change systems. And the issues of improving and making sure indoor air quality, airborne pathogens are addressed in that is critical because if we miss that opportunity, uh, it's really not going to matter what we're talking about in our little space because the big space of where the big change is coming and moving with respect to buildings is going to happen uh, without us. And so we have to you know, invite ourselves to those tables, um, be part of that discussion. And we have to look to everywhere we can to try and move the knowledge, uh, move the recommendations into actual requirements and actual practice. Thanks so much. A perfect two minutes. Um, Tomas. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tomas Aragon. I'm the director of the California Department of Public Health and the State Public Health Officer for California. Um, I've been here almost two years prior to coming here. I was the, the health officer of San Francisco. So I've been immersed in, in COVID from the very, very beginning. And I want to start by just expressing my gratitude because the science that came out of folks, the science that came out, the early science that came out had a big influence uh, in, for me in San Francisco and then for us in California, because we embraced uh, that COVID was airborne. <laughs> very early on and uh, integrated that into our, our, our policy making. I've learned a tremendous amount today and we've been fortunate here in California, we developed what we call the SMARTER plan. The SMARTER plan is, 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 is the plan to sort of take us into the future with COVID. SMARTER is an acronym, S stands for shots, MASS stands for awareness, I'm sorry, M, M S for shots, M for mask, and in that category of masks is where we bring in the issue of indoor air quality. Um, a for awareness, R for readiness, T for testing, E for education, and RX for, for treatment. Under the category of, of ventilation, the, the state is committed. We are, uh, we, we're in the process right now of putting together a list. We're gonna have an indoor air quality task force that's going to address indoor air quality from a comprehensive perspective, multidisciplinary, uh, we're going to be inviting academic experts to come and 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 help and help us out, and so I'm really looking forward to working um, with uh, scientists on uh, science policymakers, community advocates to really bring this forward. California has almost 40 million people, very diverse, and so I think we're we're a laboratory of what's possible 
in the United States. So we look forward to working with, with all of you. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bill, I'll turn to you uh, now. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, you know, my background is is uh, in engineering and in, in building science, and I've worked with the ASHRAE uh, Epidemic Task Force as its chair. So I'll, I'll direct my comments mainly uh, that way. And I think, uh, you know, reflecting on everything we've, we've heard today, there's a lot of uh, technology that has sound science behind it. The question is, how do we get it into use? And I've become more and more convinced over time that what we really need is to have a national IAQ model standard or code, uh, because one of the big things that uh, was a problem throughout the pandemic so far was confusion, different sources of information that weren't saying the same thing, and, and a lot of the responsibility being pushed down to state and local level. So I really think that's a, a critical thing to do. And of course, we don't have a a standard on the shelf that covers uh, infection control for all buildings, but I think we have good standards we can start with, and then we can build them up by uh, addressing the low-hanging fruit that we talked about earlier. I'd also like to say that I think that education is going to be critical. I don't believe we have a workforce that right now is prepared to implement uh, better IAQ in buildings the way that we're talking about it. And uh, but maybe the final point here, just to keep time short is, is existing buildings. As uh, Andy personally pointed out, they're the real problem. Uh, if we focus on what the, the next uh, new building should look like, that's going to be a little help, but really the, the place we can have an impact is by making existing buildings better. And so I think a lot of effort needs to go into that. Thank you. Great, uh, thanks. Um, Brooke, um, on to you. Yeah, uh, so my name is Brooke Bozik. I'm a program officer in the respiratory diseases branch at NIAID NIH. Um, and so, you know, one of the things we're addressing today is kind of everybody's role here. So, you know, in terms of NIAID and kind of where we see ourselves, you know, it we're primarily a, a funding agency. And I, I think there's still a lot of room for, for basic research and, you know, new knowledge to understand how transmission is occurring um, and what strategies can, can mitigate that. Um, so, you know, I see that there is more work to be done and, you know, supporting foundational research needed for decision making in these areas, as well as research to, you know, kind of evaluate these strategies that come up with um, in terms of seeing how well they actually perform. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at it from the angle of pathogen and host and what are the unique features biologically that cause transmission to occur and how this interacts with the environment and across different environments. Um, you know, we've been really interested in studying transmission for a long time. You know, NIAID has strategic plans uh, for COVID and for influenza research that call out transmission. Um, and I think we've come a long way during the time of the COVID, COVID pandemic. And there has, you know, been a lot of interest in this area. And we've come up with a lot of new um, insights. But I, I think there's still a lot of, you know, stuff that we need to cover. Things that were covered kind of in the first session about basic knowledge gaps, about with the dominant mode of transmission and does this vary between pathogens? You know, things that mitigate uh, COVID spread, are they really gonna work for, uh, you know, influenza, RSV, rhinoviruses? You know, how does transmission vary between different types of environments? The size of the transmission bottleneck and the infectious dose, you know, how well are some of these technologies, these mitigation measures gonna work if you, know, you can get infected by only, you know, being exposed to one to 10 variants? Um, so, you know, in terms of foundational research, I think there's still a lot of room there to improve. Um, and then NIAID also, I will say, funds some work in the, the technology development, not necessarily the, the ventilation and the, you know, indoor air quality, but just in terms of do we have the tools necessary to measure um, air quality when it comes to transmission? Um, so, you know, can we really collect and quantify and characterize these airborne viral particles? Because uh, if the methods we're using, you know, are they really going to provide us really useful information if we're picking up a lot of airborne particles that aren't actually viable or infectious? Um, so again, I think, you know, coming from the, the research side, I think there's still some foundational knowledge and technology that we can improve to better uh, address this problem. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, John, let me turn to you next. 
Uh, yeah, I have to apologize. I just got off a plane, so I've missed <laughs> Thank you. pretty much everything. So I uh, just want to mention that uh, as everybody's read in the newspaper, uh, we at CDC are involved in a, a whole review of the last three years and uh, happy to answer any questions that, that folks may have. Okay, thanks. And we will uh, certainly come back to it. And I think, uh, let me turn uh, to uh, our colleagues from uh, Environmental Protection Agency, um, Dave and Sean. Thanks. Sean, do you want to speak first, um, sort of following uh, Brooke, uh, given her the focus of her remarks on research, then I can talk a little bit about policy. Does that work, Sean? Sure, yeah. Thanks, Dave. Can you hear me okay? You're good, Sean. Okay, so throughout the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, our uh, research program, our researchers really quickly pivoted to really support EPA's important role in helping reduce environmental transmission routes, um, especially addressing many of the stakeholders' challenges and questions that they had related to the multitude of these innovative approaches, products that were being advertised or coming out to, to support disinfection needs. So common questions that we would get, you know, does this really work like they say it does? To, do these data really make sense and do they relate to, to our specific application and use? So this research for us continues now. Um, we're, we're now more focused on technologies to address airborne pathogens. Um, but unfortunately, many of these types of technologies or devices such as UV devices, they're not routinely reviewed or verified by EPA uh, under the current regulatory framework that we have for efficacy and safety. So within our Office of Research and Development, we're continuing to test both in-room and in-duct technologies against airborne virus using a systematic approach in a large chamber with mock HVAC system to really help to provide results that could be more directly related to actual application of these technologies. So the good news, like you heard you know, throughout today's workshop, the good news is that there are promising advances in attempts to, to more effectively address airborne pathogens. Yeah, I think we do also have to pause and ask the important questions on the actual effectiveness and any potential unintended side effects when moving from, you know, model concepts to lab testing to the actual implement implementation of these, these technologies. So a concern that I, you know, continue to have is the potential for overestimation of innovative technology performance, really, I'd say before it's ready, right, from our models or from our lab testing that may lead to over-reliance on these technologies, over-reliance on the potential effect in, this, in these technologies, and then the sort of reduction or under-reliance on other layered approaches that are also effective. Great. So Dave? Okay, Dave. Yeah, um, I think one of the things I wanna do is just appreciate the academies for this workshop and sort of the, the focus here on uh, airborne pathogens indoors um, in the context of us being immersed in trying to address uh, the continuing pandemic and, and, and us thinking about the lessons learned here and where we are positioned as a society now and where we go in the for the long haul. I think there's a very different awareness at all levels of society, perhaps not in the average person uh, who is managing all kinds of things about the importance of indoor air, um, what we breathe indoors for public health and well-being for the long term. Um, and so I think one of the things we need, you know, that's obvious is these learning from what we have about how to advance practices what practices we're learning about how to reduce uh, uh, airborne transmission of disease in the context of COVID, um, integrating those into our learning to change the building stock for the long term is a, is a critical thing uh, in front of us. And I think each, each of the folks here, there's a multitude of uh, federal agencies and private sector entities um, that are needed here uh, to advance for the long-term improvements in ventilation, filtration, air cleaning, and other operations uh, in, in how we run our buildings to promote public health. Okay, um, thank you. And, you know, we have a lot to uh, talk about. And um, I think we, maybe we, let's, let's start with thinking about the short-term. Uh, I think we've heard that there are many things that we could do that we are not doing. I think we talked a lot about some of the barriers. And then for the longer term, I think everybody is 
agree that there are things to be done and, and opportunities in a sense to take preventive strategies as the building stock continues to, um, to um, evolve. So let's focus on our first part. We have lots of time to talk. On the, on the short term, we've heard about things that can work, but let, then let me um, suggest uh, that we start with um, uh, how we can move forward um, with things that work, the diversity of people involved, the stakeholders. Uh, sounds like uh, California is on one, uh, one track for the state. And, and Tomas, maybe let me start with you perhaps on um, how you uh, see California implementing the, uh, let's see, the smarter plan, I guess, uh, and how you'll uh, engage with the many parties that you need to work with. Yeah, thank you for um, thank you for that question. So we do we do have a team of uh, scientists who are working on this. They already work on indoor indoor air air quality um, and have been very active right now. Um, have been active throughout the pandemic, focusing on raising awareness around indoor air quality, providing guidance for schools and uh, other other uh, uh, settings. So right now their current plan is, so they put, they're putting together a plan. I'll just mention a couple of major areas. They've organized it, um, uh, these five categories, administrative, which is just how do we organize uh, at the governmental level. The next one is about raising awareness of uh, the government, about understanding the science, understanding the, te the technical components. Um, the, the fourth area is working on stakeholder support. And then the last area is thinking about how much this is going to cost. So funding is an issue. Under stakeholder support, we will be having what we're calling innovation awards. And we're going to have five different category of innovations award to engage different components. One is a community workforce, uh, an innovation award around technology, an innovation award around innovative science and publications. And then the last one is an innovation award with school monitoring, awarding schools that are coming up with innovative ways to monitor air quality in their schools. So that's uh, that. this is all in the planning stage and we're putting together our interagency task force. And uh, we have a list, tentative list for our advisory, scientific advisory committee. So that's where we're at right now. So that's our first step. We've been working on this for several months and you'll, uh, you'll be hearing more in, in the coming weeks. Okay, yeah, good. Um, I wonder just to continue around our panelists, uh, uh, Peg, and then perhaps uh, Bill, others, please weigh in here. Well, I'm very interested in what they're doing in California. I might just ask who's involved, because I think part of this is to make sure that, um, you know, it's not only the various agencies, but it's also the communities of interest. So as you're developing your programs, um, that you're hearing from the people about their needs as well. Because I think what it, there's, I think we can find out a lot by talking to the folks who have tried to deal with this on the ground, whether it's in schools, workplaces. I think about correctional facilities. I think about those high risk environments where we know a lot of people got sick and were exposed and continue to be exposed. And so how do we we try to bring those folks into this conversation so we can be addressing the needs and the concerns of those that still face the greatest challenges. And that's my concern that we not just do this or get into office buildings, but we're actually into those places where people are still very much at risk uh, and have a lot of concerns, but also have a lot to offer in terms of information about what would be useful to them. Master, you want to respond at all to that? Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, we 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 completely agree with you. And um, that uh, experience and relationship building occurred because of COVID, because we had we had to deal with all those areas. So um, uh, absolutely. And so we we the way that we operationalize that is we work really closely with local health departments because they're in the community, they know the stakeholders, they're they're um, it's it's that. The way that we build trust, so it's it's a combination of both state public health, state agencies, and then local local public health. So yes, we totally agree with you. Thank you for mentioning that. But I would also say workplaces are sort of a unique area because the public health agencies they don't operate so much in workplaces. You've got 
state OSHAs, you've got Fed OSHA, yeah. you've got a different community of folks. And I think we've got to bring these communities together uh, so that they can be talking to each other because there are different issues, there are different barriers, there are different cultures uh, involved uh, and different challenges. So. Yeah, th thank you for, for bringing that up. So within uh, CDPH, we have a section that's focused on occupational right. health. You're and unique in that we way. <laughs> also work, we also work really closely with Cal OSHA yeah. that does um, um, uh, deals with uh, that from a work, work workplace requirement perspective. So we work really we work really closely. It's terrific. Yeah, John, do you want to weigh in with you? The work the, the W word has been uh, spoken here and Come sure. On. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the other group that I would add, and I think echoing what, what Peg is saying, is the HVAC system folks. Um, without them, nobody's going to go anywhere. Um, and, and I think SMACNA, the, the National Association, is a good start uh, to bring those people in. You know, th there's sort of a, a trinity here of HVAC experts, industrial hygienists, and public health. And unless those three groups really talk to each other and those three groups develop consensus, clearly it's going to be really hard for federal agencies, whether it's us at CDC, NIOSH, uh, EPA, uh, whatever, to, to, to bring, we can't force them together. So that has to be a natural uh, development. Great. And Bill, let me go back to, um, to you. I mean, and, and just talking on the short term, I know you you mentioned that perhaps a, a national level guidance or standard would be important. That would, if we ever get there, it's probably going to take a long time to get there, I suspect. Yeah, well, I, I would make the analogy to energy. So right back in the 70s, ASHRAE was asked to develop an energy standard, and they did that, and it's become the national code basis energy standard. Not everyone has a standard 90.1 compliant energy code, but most states do. And, and I, I would say that that uh, maybe is a model for a, uh, a way of getting there. My, my concern about the way we do things now is that the building codes only contain a little bit of what's in the best code intended standards. If you look at the codes that are used to, to build buildings, they may be, they have ventilation rates in them, but they don't address operation and maintenance. They don't address filter efficiencies. So the standards themselves need some work, but also how we get things from the best uh, uh, model standards into the, the building codes. And I think leadership from the national level would be helpful with that. I, I will comment. There's a comment that came in uh, from a participant, just a comment that the Utah State Health Department has not said or done anything yet in regards to aerosols and IAQ. I mean, I think this just speaks to the heterogeneity of the um, landscape and whether Bill, the kind of approach you're proposing is something that would lead to a more uniform uh, approach and perhaps more uniform considerations about what acceptable levels of risk are and how we uh, achieve them. But uh, Dave, let me go on to uh, to you. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to offer sort of heard the term Trinity before, uh, which is a great term, um, but it seems to me there's um, maybe one lens in on this is, is five systems that I think we need to continue to press forward on. Um, we know a lot about what needs to be done. Um, that being said, there's a lot more to learn. Um, and so, you know, our research and, and, and science components to, to lay the foundation, continue to build out our understanding about um, transmission of, of uh, airborne pathogens and indoors, that, that's a system that we, we need to continue to promote uh, and invest in. Um, but their systems change other places as well. One of the things our program does that I believe is critical is, is try to codify indoor air as a priority um, at all ranges, at all levels of, um, of society um, from uh, um, a priority within the systems or or the building ownership and operation itself, um, a building, a school district, a local government, state government, business enterprise, codifying indoor air as a priority, I think is another critical, a critical systems change. Um, we've talked about codes and standards and, uh, and needing to 
um, have uh, consistency and, and take advantage of the science there to have them in the best place possible. Um, the professional service uh, provider and equipment supply chain is a system that, um, you know, thank, in one way, thankful that it's being burdened now because that means there's a lot of services and products being demanded, but but having that squared away. And then finally, the resources uh, to support this, particularly in low-income uh, communities. Uh, if we're going to pursue health equity, um, we need to um, support the, the uh, resource needs. Um, and so I, I want to just identify all five of these as things that we need to con uh, continue to press on. And I think there's a unique opportunity to really advance all of those right now. I think just uh, as a historical comment, I think some of us were saying the same things about 30 years ago. Um, <laughs> perhaps there's enough of a lever for a policy shift now to... Um, make uh, make this um, happen. Um, Bill, and then uh, Brooke, I'm going to come back to you with a question from the chat. Uh, Bill. Yeah, I was going to say uh, 30 years ago and 20 years ago, you know, we went through a, a, a lot of research on how to protect people from, from uh, bioaerosols indoors after 9-11, and it didn't come to much in the end. And I think my uh, message is that we need to be aware that that could happen again and have to understand what the barriers and challenges are and, and work to overcome those. Yeah, I think the thing that's, I'm hopeful, uh, it's, a, it's an ironic outcome, but uh, not everybody was affected right where they live uh, by some of those other um, events that we've had before in a way that was so present to them. Yeah, that, that, and, that's uh, the difference. Yeah, and, and I think also, uh, I forgot to say, we really need to bring all of this together with IAQ. There's not indoor air quality and and uh, protection from pathogens. It, we'll really succeed if we bring both of those streams together, wellness and, and air quality generally. Let's see, uh, Tomas, continuing down the same track here. Yeah, so I want to just uh, add on to that uh, comment. I, I think so in California, um, along with dealing with indoor air quality for uh, uh, preventing pathogen transmission, there's two other big things out there that are impacting California. <laughs> One of it is, is wildfire smoke. So when wildfire smoke happens, you know, the instructions to open your windows don't work. You got to shut your windows, and that means the risk indoors goes, goes up. And so uh, that, so that's one area. Um, is it dealing with that? The other one is, of course, you know, heat waves. You know that we're that we're having, and so just extremes of weather means that you 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 end up having to close. Natural ventilation ends up not being a solution. So some of the engineering technological approaches even even are going to be more important in those scenarios. These are going to be more common. So I think we have to incorporate that long term thinking into our narrative. That's it. Okay. Uh, and I would just uh, reintroduce or restate, um, I think the very urgent need uh, to be dealing directly with folks from the Department of Energy uh, in those places, which are really gonna, and the folks in the climate office at the White House that are gonna be moving the policy and the money <laughs> and the requirements on what needs to be done with respect to decarbonization and energy efficiency. I mean, that's where the money's gonna come from. That's where the change is gonna come from. And if all the criteria have nothing to do with indoor air quality, including exposure to indoor you know, pathogens, we've missed the boat. And you know, it was back in uh, 20, 30 years ago with energy uh, efficiency and energy concerns, we closed up all the buildings uh, and we weren't part of those discussions. And so we've gotta be in the places where the change is happening and is happening now. And so uh, as Tomas pointed out in the area of wildfires, uh, you know, heat, climate change, that's where the action's gonna be, right? I mean, everybody thinks this pandemic is over and maybe there'll be another one, but we've gotta be in the places where people are putting the energy, you know, the time and the money right now. Great, and Bill, back to you, did you, and Sean? I think Sean had his hand up first. I wanna give him a chance. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, just just quickly, I, I know there's a lot of questions around the science and a lot of questions around, you know, how to 
develop or implement policy. I think, but one of the things that I think to like kind of build on what Peg said is that I think really maybe there's a need to include you know more stakeholder discussions, uh, getting into like what will it, what will it take for you to adopt technology? Uh, what will it, what will it take for you to make these changes rather than you know continue to focus on like a, a push down, but like, a, you know, almost a pull up, right? Yeah. And Bill. Okay, yes. Um, the, the the first point I wanted to make was to really uh, endorse what Tomas brought in by mentioning wildfires, that we need to think about uh, standards for buildings and about our design practices in terms of, of resilience, because these events happen periodically, they're, they're severe, um, we need to have buildings and building systems that can adapt to them. We don't want to run buildings that way all the time. And I think we have a lot of design standards and codes that are, are written for normal operations. Everything is okay. And the other thing I throw into this is we have to answer the question at some point, how much protection are we going to get from the building and its systems? It's one layer in the overall risk mitigation that Shelley Miller showed in her her talk, the big difference, uh, certain engineering controls plus mask uh, as opposed to, to no mask. So how much of that burden does the building have to bear so that we don't uh, overdo it on either cost or energy use? Hey, thanks. Uh, Dave, if you, I want to shift this just for a second here and um, want to go on a couple more topics, if that's okay. Do you have or do you have a short rejoinder to this? Uh, um, very briefly, John, I yeah. just want to echo Peg's remarks and appreciate ASHRAE um, about this integration of uh, energy efficiency, decarbonization, and indoor air quality. There is definitely the place where they can be integrated. ASHRAE, I think, has been working hard to, you know, to provide guidance about, you know, how to operate a building when you're in one situation versus normal operations, um, when there are different pushes and pulls, uh, depending on whether or not you're battling climate change or battling a pathogen uh, spread. Okay, I wanna move us on to sort of research needs and a strategic research agenda, in part prompted by a question um, directed at Brooke, which said, basically, you're gonna look at, uh, get researchers to study 222 nanometer um, UV. I, I think the broader question is, and you know, you could speak to it from the NIAID side first, how strategic research agenda could you develop? I mean, I know at NIH we trust to the, you know, sort of the wisdom of the crowd in part in terms of where research is going, but we can also create directions. And I, I think we could talk about this in terms of advancing the more fundamental side of the science. But the other thing I need, we think we need to talk about is what in other sectors they were called dissemination and implementation research, finding out why we're not doing what we should be doing so we can address those barriers. And that, that probably doesn't sit with NIAID, maybe it sits with CDC, but um, let's talk fundamental to applied um, here in terms of thinking about research needs. Yeah, I mean, I think NIAID, NIH is just one of the players. And I think kind of the key to this whole thing is that it has to be a multidisciplinary effort. You know, like I said, I think our role is kind of the foundation and maybe some of the evaluation down the road, not necessarily the implementation. Um, in terms of the first part of your question about attracting researchers to research some of these things, you know, NIAID does have, have mechanism, NIH in general has mechanisms to do things like that. Um, you know, we, we can put out funding announcements, we can talk to our researchers and see what the needs are and try to redirect money in certain ways, you know, try to get these new researchers to focus on certain fields. Um, but, you know, once we get that foundational research down, I, I think then it you know, in terms of strategically bringing everything together, I think the ball goes into other courts there to actually get the implementation piece in there. Um, but, you know, we, we do what we can to, to provide the information to make these decisions to, you know, come up with the best strategy. So I, I think multidisciplinary, that, that is the big thing and how to engage everyone across the board to come to the table. So I think session three was a great setup to this, this discussion about sort of dissemination and implementation, but let me pose the question to you, whose court does the ball fall into for this uh, and trying to get, get us to use what works and uh, who might be in charge? Uh, 
John, I'll, uh, maybe see if you want to provide some thoughts from the CDC NIOSH perspective here. Well, you know, I'm sort of mired in the past um, as opposed to the future because of uh, the last three years. And I can honestly say that probably amongst the list of um, things that uh, I regret uh, and wish that we had done better is the whole issue about the connection between transmission and ventilation. Uh, we spent a lot of time um, worrying about large particles dropping near the source. And as the pandemic went on, people began to look at, at other areas. Um, unfortunately, both on the international agency level and on the US national level, we were not responsive. Um, a lot of the issues had to do with some research uh, problems. People would find RNA far away from the source and they'd say, well, it's an aerosol. Well, then we'd have to say, look, you have to culture it. You have to see whether it's actually viable, et cetera. All of that research pretty much went on during the pandemic. And I think we're in a different place than we were before. Um, certainly NIH can do all the research they want to on transmission of specific viral uh, entities. But I think in terms of SARS coronavirus 2, I think we've established that aerosol transmission is a real thing. Um, and I think we have to build on that and go from there and then bring in the issue of ventilation, whether it be dilution or filtration or disinfection into that research milieu based on this particular virus. Okay, other, uh, others want to comment on this broad um, question of, you know, getting us to do better, doing what we know should work. I just want to build real quick on what John said. I, I think that's definitely true for COVID, and I think that's what stimulated a lot of this research here. But in terms of forward thinking and kind of broader thinking, I think it's worth bringing in that idea of, of other pathogens. And aerosol transmission clearly occurs, and it occurs across the board, but kind of, you know, the, the percent transmission or the contribution of that versus other um, modes of transmission. And when we're thinking broadly about how to, you know, improve indoor environments, how we're making sure we're taking all of that into account. We're not just improving environments in terms of COVID, but you know all the other respiratory diseases, airborne diseases that are out there that are going to continue to be issues. Yeah, but that gets at the issue of the criticism that we have had that CDC speaks to academia. It does not speak to real people out there trying to solve an immediate problem, which is SARS coronavirus 2, not a panoply, a broad spectrum of a whole bunch of other viruses. So, you know, focus, I think if you're in NIH, it's a different thing. At CDC, we're trying to focus on what the problem is now. Okay, Pat? Um, I could just mention, I mean, there is a couple of initiatives going on right now, which will translate certain practices uh, into hopefully effective controls. Uh, one is hopefully we will see a permanent COVID standard in healthcare out of OSHA in the next month or two, which will make a difference in a lot of those environments, not just the hospitals, but the nursing homes over time on a permanent basis. The other thing the agency OSHA is working on and has been for decades now is an infectious disease standard. They'll focus on healthcare, but I think we need to think about more broadly, what are the other high risk environments? And that's gonna be a place where there's the opportunity to bring this knowledge base and to turn it into some practice in workplaces that affect the health and safety of millions of Americans. So look to those opportunities that exist. Uh, California has been a leader in this area as well. So I think look to the, the you know, where there's action happening, you know, we gotta make sure that we're there. Bill? Uh, yes, a couple of points. You know, one is risk can be, Anywhere, if you look at, at uh, healthcare ventilation standards, they uh, they focus on the spaces where we believe the 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 infectious people are, and there are a lot of spaces in healthcare facilities that are not very well ventilated, don't have much filtration, and we learn from asymptomatic or presymptomatic transmission that that's not really a, a good idea. So that's one point I wanted to make is that we we do really think differently. The the uh, other is. I think there's a difference between doing science rigorously and having 
uh, a public health response that is timely and effective. And I think that's what we're getting out of these discussions that are coming out of the CDC. Um, I believe that uh, we had a lot of suggestive evidence that might have motivated in invoking a precautionary principle early on. And it took a long time for those who are really the experts in infectious disease epidemiology to be sure enough to agree with those who were just being cautious. And in the meantime, we could have probably done more good for a lot of people if we'd been willing to, to bet a little more on the evidence that we had in hand about airborne transmission. Thanks. So um, just to maybe close out, we've been talking about research. I will say on the dissemination and implementation side, I think we're going to learn a lot from the work that will go on in California that is um, planned. I think, you know, I'm going to ask a rhetorical question, uh, which is, do we need a strategic research agenda uh, that it probably would have a short-term and long-term component? I suspect if I said, please raise your hand, hopefully you would all raise your hand. Um, and uh, then my next question, though, is if we were to pursue such a research um, agenda, how would we actually do it? Um, and, you know, there are multiple different communities involved. The issues range from fundamental aspects of uh, viruses to broad aspects of human uh, behavior. And I think uh, we could list out many questions uh, that if we answered them, we could do a better job in reducing risk. But in, in, in the context of this very multidisciplinary, multi-agency, multi-institute, whatever you want, how do we how do we think about creating an agenda that would be useful? Uh, who would be in charge? Could such a thing be done? Could it be implemented? Um, could our government agencies pull together? They pull together enough around interagency task forces to um, take this on. So let me let me throw um, that uh, out for discussion. Yeah, I'll start. You know, the American Pandemic Preparedness Plan is in draft form now at the White House, and and it includes uh, a lot of different uh, issues that you're talking about, uh, Dr. Savin. And I think that once that's published, I think it could be a springboard uh, to uh, a, a wide ranging, comprehensive public private sector research gap type uh, strategic plan. That's the easy part. And then getting it funded uh, is, uh, is the hard part, as, as Peg mentioned uh, before. Uh, but I think that's where we're headed. There is efforts at the White House to try to put together this plan and to create a roadmap for all of us. Uh, and certainly the issue of ventilation in indoor spaces uh, is there. Uh, we put it there. Uh, at CDC. And, and so I'm hoping that that will be uh, an avenue for us. Thanks, John. Uh, Tomas? Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, it definitely has to be, all of this, of course, has to be transdisciplinary. I think involving public health is really critical because we have to deal with these issues anyway across all the different settings that it occurs um, and all the different issues that come up. There's a, there's a few key things that I've learned in the last couple of years that I think are really important. And that is we have to think about whatever, whatever framework we come up with, we always have to ask the question, how do we help people make decisions in the setting of uncertainty? Because there's always gonna be information gaps. So when there's information gap, how can we help make decisions? The other thing is something that I always remind people is that there's no absolute right answer. There are only trade-offs. Um, and so, because what happens is every time we every time we do something, even if we go right down the middle, we 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 upset people on multiple sides because it doesn't meet meet, meet their exact expectations. And then uh, the, the last couple of co concepts, of course, and that goes on with thinking about unintended consequences, and so monitoring what happens. And then the last thing that we that we struggle with when we're implementing uh, policies, especially around emergencies is the balance between when should we be doing recommendations versus requirements? Because requirements always involves you oftentimes some types of restrictions and getting people to do things that they don't want to do, even if it's a business owner or, or, it, or it's an individual. So getting that balance right can be, can be a real challenge. Um, 
in theory, we would not need we would not need requirements if if people just agreed with recommendations, but that has to do with uh, uh, culture and differences in values, and there's a lot of variability in that across across different uh, geographies. So, let me stop. Thank there. you. I wonder if uh, Sean and uh, Dave want to weigh in. Sure, I, I can start and <clears throat> turn to Dave. So I think you know I want to applaud like Dave did applaud efforts like this. <clears throat> that um, you know, bring folks together, you know, experts together, just have that conversation as well as listen to the public questions and comments uh, related to these kind of um, you know this topic. Also, the OSTP um, and they're they're bringing you know agencies departments together to to talk through questions and try to put a research agenda together. What what do research questions look like on certain technologies? But I also think it goes broader. I think there is a push, and you hear a lot of um, push for you know the, the latest new technology that's out there. I think it's got to go broader, and, and again, to go back to to what Peg mentioned, really involve those um, the stakeholders, the end users at the I call it the lowest level, right? And and just say, okay, well, what are your problems? What is it going to take for you to to uh, make this change or adopt a, a certain technology or or a solution? And then really try to, to look at the research questions from that perspective as, as well, and not just kind of the technologies from, hey, this works great in the lab, let's figure out how we push it out there, but also from the other side of it and figure out really really what are the, you know, what's really needed for adoption and try to answer the questions that way as well. Now, Dave, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I was gonna um, reflect on a couple things that uh, go beyond the research agenda, which, I, as I mentioned, I think that's kind of the first pillar uh, often here is making sure we, uh, we we might not know all the answers all the time, and we do have to deal with uncertainty, but to, to make sure we understand what we're dealing with um, as best as possible. But a big part of getting the change, um, you know, has to do with uh, the psychology of the risk that we're trying to address. And, um, you know, it is just the way we're wired that uh, when it's our choice about a risk, uh, we don't respond as aggressively as when we have a risk imposed upon us. Um, and uh, so dealing with indoor air risks is a is a interesting issue because it's often where people are and they feel like they have some control over that and they don't react as strongly to trying to make a change as when a risk or a pollutant is imposed upon them. And so, and a lot of this risk is where people live. And that's where we spend most of our indoor time too, is in our homes. So there's a real, I think, critical need to help people recognize and 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 more deeply bake into public recognition that a lot about your life, your health, your well-being, how your kids are gonna grow, learn, advance, do well in life is about what you breathe and are exposed to indoors. Um, I think, and that's a fundamental piece that I think we need to continue to try and push uh, if we're going to uh, make long-term change in addition to the system changes that we've been talking about today. Great, thanks, Peg. But you're on mute, uh, Peg. Um, to follow up on that, and, and not to disagree that that's the case in, a lot of environments, but in many environments, people don't have control. They don't have decision making, and there has to be a system, and there has to be some requirements um, or some real, you know, strong motivation for those who are responsible to take action. I can't tell you the number of times we got calls from teachers, public employees, others in buildings were full of mold, um, just all kinds of problems, and there was nothing they could do about it. There were no standards, there's no authority. And so I do think we have to look at the gaps that exist are, you know, not just in the knowledge, we have a lot of knowledge, but how do you make that, um, you know, what going back to what Bill said, the core standards that are needed to make that clear, that's what should be done. And then the ways to make it happen so that those people who wanna take action, you know, have some, not only tools, but they've got some support behind them to bring about the change because it's not gonna happen 
um, just because, you know, a few people get together and say, well, we think this should happen. Uh, there's too much um, pushback. There's too many obstacles and too many burdens. So we do need the power of the authorities making very clear up front that, you know, right now there is no question. We know that this is primarily an airborne disease with respect to COVID. It would really help if CDC, you know, made that very clear. If OSHA actually put guidelines up there that weren't two years old, when people go to places that they have clear information about what the risk is, and this is what we know, and this, this is what can be done. Because a lot of the stuff that's up there for the government sites on COVID is way out of date. It's still very confusing. Uh, even those of us who do this every day, it's you know a hell of a problem just trying to find the information that's the most current and the most applicable to your situation. So to my friends in government, I would say, you know, clean up the information out there, bring it up to date, archive the, you know, the old stuff. Uh, we don't need all of it. We need what we know now and what we need to move forward with. Thanks, Peg. I think uh, we need to wind up. I think your last sentence, I think, summarized a lot of things. We have many things we could do and we should get going, I think, to summarize your action-oriented um, Phrasing, I, I will say just within the chat, there are a few other things that came in. I'll just note that someone asked about uh, potentially having um, uh, indoor environmental quality standards more generally and having them at the international um, level. I mean, I think it's useful to, to remember that not only did we proceed differently in different ways across the states, but um, across nations. Uh, one other thought I had is uh, they were discussing there is one indoor air pollutant that we controlled, and it was through a combination of public education and regulation. That's secondhand smoke. And if you uh, think about it, it offers a sort of a useful contrast because um, uh, in part by its simplicity, um, because it was a, a readily identifiable source, sort of one agent. And I think we had enough science early on to know there was a risk and what was needed to um, to uh, control it, and and certainly regulations made a huge difference. I think uh, this uh, session has been, uh, I think, very helpful in highlighting the uh, complexity and the layering of the issues that we are talking uh, talking about. And I think that um, we will wait and see what lessons we learn from uh, California. I think it would be very interesting. Uh, John, per your reminder of what will come out of the um, White House and how the agencies um, will um, respond. So I want to thank you all for, uh, I think, a very thoughtful discussion to wrap things um, up uh, today. And with that, I'll turn, uh, Lindsay, uh, back to you. And uh, thanks to the, uh, thanks so much to the panelists. Hi, we have reached the end of our workshop for today, um, we're going to wrap up and summarize some of the key points that we took from this to take away from the discussion. I'd like to share one of the slides I showed um, during the opening, which is this framework slide. Um, we, we've kind of sessions one and two really focused on efficacy of kind of research practice and mechanistic understanding of what works, kind of the research, uh, and what does that show so far? In sessions three and four, we transition to um, effectiveness and how do we actually implement what we know works and then verify that it is working. And so some of the take-home points that, that I've drawn from sessions one and two are, uh, let's see, first, we have overwhelming evidence that infectious SARS-CoV-2 is released in fine aerosol particles and that masking, ventilation, filtration, and UV reduce the amount of virus in the air and thus reduce the risk of transmission. These approaches are stronger together than alone, and this is also true for other airborne pathogens. Second, engineering controls are an effective way to mitigate the risk of transmission that don't rely on individual behavior, and we also need to consider energy efficiency when we strategize about using these. Three, a higher ventilation rate is better. Keeping it above somewhere around maybe six air changes per hour seems to be helpful, although there are other factors that also matter, like the number of people present, the type of activity, 
and interpersonal variability in the amount of virus that's released. Fourth, we need to start with the basics, making sure that our ventilation, filtration, and UV systems that we already have are appropriately designed, sized, and operated in existing buildings, and especially the worst case ones. Five, once the basics are established, you can then think about details such as placement of air cleaners, optimization of the ventilation system, use of CO2 sensors, and newer innovations. Six, one of these, far UV, holds promise for disinfecting the air, although more research is still needed. And then finally, to summarize, we have a lot of tools. It's time to open up the toolbox, make sure the tools are in good working order, and use them in various combinations to build healthier indoor environments. John, do you want to go ahead and summarize? Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and summarize um, our sessions three and four. And I, I have to say, I think um, number three uh, really focused nicely on why we are or not using uh, what works as the part of um, four. I think um, that we talked a lot about uh, some of the barriers and some of the tools that might be used to hasten uh, effective implementation. We have potentially several models, uh, the work of Reverend Evans and his colleagues with the black churches. We have the state of California, and I'm sure there are others that will emerge as useful um, case, uh, case studies. We know we would like to continue to um, advance the scientific foundation, and uh, we need some way to have an organized research um, agenda for that uh, purpose. We will need uh, leadership at the national level, and let's hope that uh, comes out of the uh, planning at the level of the White House and uh, the agencies that will be um, involved in uh, what it is that comes um, next. I think in the, you know, the, the general model of implementing what works and then learning, is it working? Surveillance and evaluation, I think, is probably still an area of weakness and one needing uh, development. We don't have... Um, key indicators, for example, that might be available for critical building uh, types. Uh, perhaps with schools, we do have a, a step up uh, there, but we have a wide range of buildings that we would want to know how well they are working and what has been done to reduce risk of, um, uh, of transmission. Tools to, to measure airborne virus that might advance things, or CO2 perhaps, other uh, tools we will need as we move into surveillance and evaluation. Because it's really what is really lacking from this um, diagram is that there should be loops in it of feedback so that we are continually um, enhancing uh, our ability to put efficacious approaches um, into, um, into action. I think the other point that uh, I'll leave us with, and one that, of course, came up in our discussion in session four was there are different time domains here. And uh, with regard to implementing what we know works, we should be getting on with it, but then also setting in place um, an agenda for the um, longer term. So uh, with that very brief summary of an awful lot of good um, and rich uh, discussion, uh, Lindsay, back to you. Yeah, speaking of agendas uh, in the future, this is just the first workshop in a series of three where we review lessons learned, promising practices and innovations for managing pathogens in the indoor environment. The next two workshops will focus on schools and public transportation. Details about those will be announced um, starting next week. So, we... so we'd like to um, thank our speakers and panelists for sharing their expertise. Uh, I'd also like to thank the National Academy staff, especially Audrey Thevenin, Courtney Hill, and Crystal Saunders for doing all the heavy lifting to make this happen. And thank you, the audience members, for joining us. You're the ones who will be helping put this into practice, and we hope to see you at our next workshop on schools.